Chapter 12, Part 8 of Stolen Souls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Annapurna Stolen Souls by William Lequeux Chapter 12, Part 8 Frith Street is the centre of the foreign quarter of London. The narrow, shabby thoroughfare retains, even on the brightest day in summer, its habitual depressing air of grimy cheerlessness. But enveloped in the yellow fog of a November evening, its aspect is unutterably dismal. Its denizens are a very shady colony, mostly the scum of continental cities who, owing to various causes, have been compelled to flee from the police and seek a safe asylum in the region between Shaftesbury Avenue and Oxford Street. In a meagerly furnished sitting room on the top floor of one of the dingiest houses in this mean street, a young man sat gazing moodily into the fire. He was of foreign appearance, about twenty-six years of age, tall, dark, and rather good-looking, his negligence of attire gave him a dash of the genial good-for-nothing, yet his pale face wore a grave, thoughtful expression as his chin rested upon his hand in an utterly dejected attitude. Beside him, with her hand placed tenderly upon his shoulder, stood a tall, fair-haired woman several years his junior. She was eminently beautiful with delicately moulded features and soft grey eyes that betrayed an intense anxiety. It was evident that she was not an inhabitant of that dismal quarter, for the hat she wore was of the latest French mode. Her cloak, which had fallen unheeded to the floor, was heavily lined with sable, while upon her hand were several fine rings that gleamed and sparkled in the feeble rays of the solitary candle. But... Paul, why cannot you remain? Here in London you are safe, she argued, speaking in French and bending over him with earnestness. Impossible, he replied, shaking his head gloomily. It is unsafe to stay here. I must start for America tomorrow. And leave me, she cried. No, no, we must not part. You know how madly I love you and she smoothed his hair tenderly. Ah, Adine, he sighed. Heaven knows, mine will be a bitter sorrow. Taking her hand, he raised it reverently to his lips. In the silence that followed, the bells of a neighboring church chimed slowly. Seven o'clock, she exclaimed suddenly. I must go at once for I have invited some people to dine at the hotel. Come now, promise me you will not leave London. You are quite safe here in this place. Besides, what have you to fear? The police are searching all over Europe for me. Do not be discouraged. We shall baffle them yet. I shall return tomorrow afternoon at four, when we can discuss matters further. Be cheerful for my sake, Paul. And she bent and kissed him. Ah, Aideen, you are my only friend, he said brokenly. I am tired of being hunted from place to place, and have been thinking that away in Mexico or Argentina I might be safe. But you are not going. We shall not part, she said decisively. As she spoke, she picked up her cloak and wrapped it about her. Then, shaking hands with him and lingering for a moment in his embrace, while he kissed her passionately, she opened the door and passed down the rickety stairs to the street. Paul Denisov did not offer to accompany her, but stood listening to her retreating footsteps, afterwards sighing heavily and flinging himself back again into his chair, where he sat staring aimlessly at the meagre fire. It was nearly midnight, in a cosy and well-furnished private room at the Savoy Hotel, Aideen, whose guests had departed, was sitting alone with her slippered feet upon the fender, reading. 
She had exchanged her dinner dress for a loose gown of pearl-gray silk, and her hair, unbound, fell in rich profusion about her shoulders. Presently her French maid entered noiselessly and asked, "'Will Mademoiselle require anything more?' "'No, not tonight, Ninette,' she replied, glancing up from her novel. "'Bonsoir, madame,' exclaimed the girl, and withdrew. When she had gone, Aideen took a cigarette from her silver case, and, lighting it, lay back in her chair in a lazy contemplative attitude, watching the blue smoke curl upward. For nearly a half an hour she sat engrossed in her own thoughts, when suddenly the door was thrown open. Turning, she saw a middle-aged, well-dressed man wearing the conventional silk hat and overcoat. "'Colonel Solofiev! She gasped, jumping to her feet. Yes, said the intruder, coolly, as he closed the door and turned the key. I have the honor to bear that name, and you? I need not ask. Madame Adine Orlovsky, subject of my imperial master, the Tsar? Pale, trembling, and with teeth clenched, she felt in the pocket of her dress and drew forth something bright and shining. It was a small revolver. No, no, exclaimed the colonel, laying his hand upon her arm. Put away that toy. Remember that I am chief of the English section of secret police, and to shoot me will not be a profitable pastime. I shall not harm you. Why do you intrude here, at this hour? she asked indignantly. I come as your friend. My friend, Dieu, can you believe that I've forgotten the insult you offered me when we last met? My friend, you, the chief of the Tsar's spies, she cried angrily. And you, nihilist and assassin, eh? added the other with a sinister grin. Well, well, ma belle, we will not speak of such gruesome subjects as the murder of your husband in Petersburg a year ago. My husband, she gasped. "'Have you discovered who murdered him?' "'Ah, then you do not forget the facts. "'Neither do I. "'He was found shot through the heart "'within a hundred yards of his house "'in the Vosnodsenskoy Prospect. "'The third section of Imperial Police "'have not been idle, "'and as a result of their inquiries, "'a warrant has been issued. "'For whom?' For the arrest of the woman who chooses to call herself Adine Orlovsky, on a charge of murdering her husband. <gasps> Me, she cried, such imputations are infamous. Pray, don't be alarmed, continued the colonel, speaking in Russian, and taking a cigarette from the case that lay open on the table. He seated himself and calmly lit it, saying, Sit down, I wish to talk to you. Breathless with anxiety, she sank into the nearest chair. "'You see,' he began, "'it is impossible to escape us. "'Our agents are everywhere. "'Outside the hotel at this moment are three officers ready to arrest you. "'They shall not. I'd, "'I'd rather kill myself.' "'Very well. You have the means. "'Do so,' he said with a brutal laugh. Ah, cried the unhappy woman, you, the chief of the Tsar's bloodhounds, have tracked me here, and I know that although I am innocent, it is useless for me to expect or plead for mercy. Yes, madame, the warrant from the Ministry of the Interior enables me to hand you over to the English police. When you are charged before the magistrate tomorrow morning, I shall apply for your extradition. That will be your first stage upon that long, straight road which leads to Siberia. Your dossier at the bureau is complete. Listen, I will relate the details of your crime. No, no, I do not wish to hear, she said, covering her face with her hands. I am innocent. I admit that I quarreled with my husband, but I had no thought of such a horrible deed. You confess to the quarrel? Good. Now we may advance a step further, said the colonel, stretching out his legs and contemplating the end of his cigarette. I have also discovered that you know something about the recent attempt at the Winter Palace. 
In fact, I have indisputable proof that you are a nihilist. Ah, I understand now the depth of your villainy, she said, with fierce indignation. The charge of murder is brought against me in order that I may be extradited to Russia and tried as a nihilist. It is another of your devilish schemes. You are shrewd, observed the chief of secret police with a grim smile. But I ought to indicate that I require to know more of the plans of that highly interesting circle of gentlemen who comprise the Revolutionary Executive Committee, and you are the person to furnish it. How can I when I'm not a member of the organization? To prevaricate is useless. It is only by consenting to become an agent of the third section that you can escape arrest and punishment, he said slowly. A police agent? It would mean death. Ah, so you are a revolutionist. I was not mistaken. Very well, I put it plainer. Either you will enter our service, and while retaining your connection with the Nihilist Circle at Petersburg, disclose their secrets, or I shall execute the warrant. Remember, the Ministry of Police are liberal, and you will be well paid for your information. Aideen was silent. This man was her enemy, and she saw the deeply laid plot to secure her conviction and exile to Siberia. The allegations against her of promoting the Nihilist propaganda and taking part in conspiracies were true, and she well knew how easily they could be proved. She had been an active agent in a recent attempt to wreck the Tsar's palace, the discovery of which plot had caused Paul Denisov's flight from Russia. But, on the other hand, she remembered that with members of the circle, treachery was punishable by death. Come, I am awaiting your decision, he said impatiently. In desperation she asked for time to consider, but he was inexorable, and she saw there was but one course open to her, namely, to become a spy. I, I will enter your service, she said at length in a low, hoarse voice. I cannot refuse, since you make it the price of my freedom. Very well, he exclaimed with satisfaction. You will find our Tsar a liberal master, and should occasion arise, you will receive our protection. As for your secret alliance with us, no one will be aware of it except yourself. Let us shake hands, madame, or is it mademoiselle, upon our agreement. No, Colonel Solofiev, she replied, drawing herself up haughtily. I have sufficient reason for declining that honour. It is enough that I have allied myself with your despicable spies. I must wish you good night. Very well, very well, he said in a tone of annoyance as he picked up his hat and bowed. Au revoir, madame. We shall meet again before long, he added meaningly and turning, he unlocked the door and went out. "'Tonight, tonight I am vanquished,' she muttered fiercely between her teeth when he was out of hearing. "'But henceforward I shall play a double game, and, ma foi, I intend to be victor.' A year later, Colonel Solofiev had been recalled from London and appointed chief of the secret police of St. Petersburg. His success in discovering nihilist plots in London and Paris had mainly been due to the information furnished by Aideen. Therefore, he had compelled her to return to the Russian capital and take up her residence in the great mansion that had belonged to her late husband. Her implication in the revolutionary conspiracies had placed her completely in his power, and although forced to obey, she made one stipulation— that Paul Denisov should be allowed to return to Petersburg unmolested. For a long time, the colonel withheld this permission, but at length consented, and the fugitive returned to the woman he loved. He was unaware of Aideen's alliance with the police, and she feared to tell him, lest he should despise her. 
A few members of the Revolutionary Party living in various parts of Russia had been denounced by her, and the Ministry of the Interior, believing the arrests of great importance, had commended Solofiev in consequence. But truth to tell, the persons convicted were of the least dangerous type, and she always exercised the utmost caution, lest she should bring to justice any enthusiastic member of the party, or compromise herself. Number 87, Nevsky Prospect, was a small, rather dilapidated house of three stories. The window shutters of the ground and first floors being closed gave it the appearance of being uninhabited. One apartment on the top floor, however, was furnished as a sitting room, and was tenanted occasionally by Colonel Solofiev. It would have been folly for Adine to have met the chief of police at her house, or at any place where they might be observed. Therefore, in order to elude the vigilance of spies, both police and revolutionary, that everywhere abound in the Russian capital, he had taken the house in order to provide them with a secret meeting place. One afternoon, early in spring, she was standing alone in this room, gazing thoughtfully out of the window, awaiting the man she despised and hated. Though possessing wealth, beauty and influence, her life had been fraught with much bitterness. While she was yet in her teens, she loved poor Denisov, at that time a student at Moscow University. But her mercenary mother had compelled her to marry Orlovsky, one of the merchant princes of the capital. For two years they lived together very unhappily, until late one night he was found lying dead in the street, shot by an unknown hand, Aideen mourned for him, but it was scarcely surprising that she felt some secret satisfaction at her freedom, especially when Paul, hearing of her bereavement, sought an interview and expressed his sympathy. Then she was unable to conceal the fact that she still loved him, and their mutual affection was resumed. By her marriage, Paul's life had become embittered, and this had caused him to develop into a fearless terrorist, reckless and enthusiastic in the cause of Russian freedom. When she discovered he was a nihilist, she at once joined the circle, rendering considerable pecuniary assistance to the cause, and taking a prominent part in the fierce and terrible struggle between the people and the bureaucracy. Now, however, as a spy, her position was extremely dangerous, and as she stood looking down into the broad thoroughfare, she was reviewing her past and vainly trying to devise some means by which she could escape from the web that the detested Solofiev had cast about her. In a few minutes, the man with whom she had an appointment entered. "'Ah, good afternoon,' he said, tossing his hat and stick upon a divan, and taking a chair at the table in the centre of the room. Be seated, I have some news for you. Do you recollect that soon after you consented to assist us, you gave me some information regarding a conspiracy at Moscow? Her face twitched nervously as she replied in the affirmative. Well, we acted upon your statement, and arrested sixteen of the revolutionists, all of whom have been tried by court-martial and sentenced to the mines. In recognition of your services in this instance, I am directed by my imperial master, the Tsar, to give you this. And taking from his pocketbook a banknote for five hundred roubles, he handed it to her. She took it mechanically, scarcely knowing what she did. The touch of the limp paper, however, brought to her mind that it was the wages of her treachery. This filled her with indignation, and her face flushed crimson. "'Have you come to offer me yet another insult, Colonel Solofiev? she cried. "'Can you believe that I have fallen so low as to accept money as the price of the lives of poor wretches who are drawn into your merciless clutches?' "'No. Tell His Majesty that he may in future keep his paltry rubles. I do not require them. See how I value the imperial munificence?' and taking the note between her fingers, she tore it into small pieces, which she scattered upon the carpet. "'We are not all so wealthy as yourself, madame,' 
he said, somewhat surprised at her unusual independence. Yet, after all, your scruples regarding these miserable curs, the nihilists, amount to no more than mere caprice. That may be so, she replied quickly, but in future... Whatever information you require, you will obtain for yourself. My efforts on your behalf have been rewarded by gross insult. Therefore, I shall refuse to disclose any other revolutionary secrets. Pardon me, madame. I have no time to bandy words with you, but your decision is somewhat too hasty. I have discovered that three days hence a desperate attempt is to be made upon the life of His Majesty during the review at Peterhof and, further, that you are implicated in it. She started. She had believed her secret safe. I have resolved to preserve silence, she said abruptly. The plot is a most serious and widespread one, he continued, and I tell you plainly that if you refuse to inform me where the meeting to arrange the final details will take place, I shall arrest both Denisov and yourself as nihilists. You have your choice. She was nonplussed, and sat twirling the ribbons of her dress with nervous fingers while he leaned his elbows upon the table, looking at her intently. "'I scarcely think it would be worth your while to refuse,' he remarked. "'For myself I care nothing. I am tired of being your puppet. You love Paul Denisov. Surely you will save him from Siberia.' She hesitated. She saw that to avoid Paul's arrest she would be compelled to sacrifice all the members of the committee to whom the elaborate plot against the autocrat Alexander had been entrusted. She shuddered at the thought of the scandal it would create were she arraigned before a court-martial for a conspiracy against the Tsar, and thought of the dreary, lifelong exile that would inevitably follow. In her bewilderment, she resolved to secure Paul's freedom at any cost. So this is but another illustration of your satanic cunning, she said at last with knit brows. I, I suppose it is imperative that I should betray my friends. And she sighed heavily. Ah, I thought you would not care to bear the consequences of refusal he exclaimed, smiling at her perplexity. "'You laugh!' she cried, her eyes flashing with anger. "'It is true that you hold my destiny in your hands, but take care you do not provoke me to desperation.' "'Threats do not become you, madame,' he replied coolly. "'Tell me, where shall I find these conspirators?' She paused. She was thinking how she could save her friends." "'You know the Bolshaya Satovaya?' she said suddenly. "'Well, almost exactly opposite the commercial bank there is a small leather shop with a large kitchen below. Go there tomorrow night at ten o'clock.' "'Not tonight?' asked the chief of police, scribbling a memorandum. "'No, tomorrow.' "'Very well,' he said, rising and putting on his hat. I am obliged for your information. Bonjour, madame. If I have been a little, a little abrupt, forgive me. A moment later, he had gone. The scene was a weird one. In a low, damp underground cellar, a dozen men and women were sitting around a table, upon the centre of which a playing card was pinned by a thin, ivory-hilted dagger. A couple of guttering candles shed a feeble light upon the pale, determined countenances of the conspirators, among whom sat poor Denisov. The elderly, wild-haired man who sat at the head of the table was speaking authoritatively, and had been explaining to those assembled the proposals for the coup at Peterhof, a map of the neighbourhood being spread before him. And now, he said gravely, we must draw lots for the removal of the traitor to whom I referred at the opening of our council. A dead silence followed, while a man who sat on the president's right prepared a number of small folded slips of paper. Upon one of these the president scribbled a name. Then they were placed together in a small box, and each of the revolutionists drew. 
in addition to the president himself, only the person who drew the paper with the name upon it knew who had been guilty of treachery, while all remained in ignorance of the chosen assassin. Then the council broke up, arranging to meet on the following night. At nine o'clock on the next evening, Paul Denisov, pale-faced and haggard-eyed, entered the hall of the great house of the Orlovskys. "'I must see Madame at once,' he said to a lackey. "'Take me to her.' A few moments later he was ushered along a spacious corridor filled with palms and exotics, through a great white and gold ballroom, and presently admitted into a small, exquisitely furnished little apartment, wherein sat Aideen in a lounge chair doing fancy needlework. "'Ah, oh, Paul!' she cried, starting to her feet. "'Why, what ails you?' "'Hush, Aideen, he said hoarsely when the door had closed. "'Someone has denounced you to the executive as a traitor. "'The council have passed sentence of death, "'and I, I've drawn the fatal number. "'You must fly. You must leave Russia at once. "'Tonight, for at midnight, I must return here to, to murder you.' "'Dear,' she gasped, "'then my secret has been divulged.' I confess it is true, Paul. I have been guilty of double dealing, but it was to save... Hark! Listen! There were sounds of voices outside the door, which a moment afterwards was flung open, revealing two ordinary-looking individuals, accompanied by several grey-coated police officers. Paul Denisov, exclaimed one of the detectives, stepping forward. In the name of our father, the Tsar, I arrest you for conspiracy. By heaven, I'll not go with you, I... In a moment he had drawn a revolver and placed himself on the defensive. But a second later the weapon was wrenched from his grasp. Aideen, pale and weeping, threw herself between him and his captors, but she was roughly thrust aside, and he was handcuffed and conveyed away to the police bureau. The Assize Court of St. Petersburg was crowded to suffocation, for a great trial of nihilists was concluding. Paul Denisov, as a preliminary to his punishment, had been kept in solitary confinement in one of the cells deep down under the fortress of St. Peter and St. Paul. Together with thirty other revolutionists, including those arrested in the Bolshaya Satovaya, he was now brought up for sentence. The rays of the afternoon sun were slanting across the court, lighting up the dais whereon sat the grave-looking judge, over whose head hung the golden double-headed eagle, surmounted by an icon or picture of the Virgin. Those in court were breathless, for sentence was about to be delivered. Presently the judge spoke. Prisoners, he said, addressing the motley row of eager-faced men and women before him, you have all been found guilty of conspiracy to cause the death of his imperial majesty the Tsar. There is but one sentence the swad allows me to pronounce, and it is that you shall be banished and kept at labor at the mines for the remainder of your lives. Above the sobs and wailing which came from the public portion of the court sounded a shrill, piercing, hysterical shriek. Paul, turning sharply, saw that a poorly clad woman, sitting in the front row of the spectators, had fainted. Her clothes were common, her hair was parted in the middle and brushed back severely, but, notwithstanding the disguise, he recognized her. It was Aideen Orlovsky. Two years had gone by. Colonel Solofiev, promoted to the rank of general, had been appointed by the Tsar, as governor of the Asiatic province of Transbaikal. In the whole of Siberia there is no region more desolate than around the Nurchinsk silver mines of Algachi and Povrotsky. Situated far away in eastern Siberia, near the Mongolian frontier, and distant five thousand versts from St. Petersburg, there is not a tree or bush to be seen in any direction and the rolling, snow-clad hills suggest in general contour the immense surges and mounds of water raised by a hurricane. 
The buildings at the entrance to the Pokrovsky mine consist only of a tool house, a shed for the accommodation of the Cossacks of the guard, and a few log-built cabins occupied by convicts allowed out on license for good behavior, while dotted here and there are sentry boxes, before which stand Cossacks leaning on their rifles. It's impossible to imagine a more terrible and hopeless existence than that to which poor Denisov had been consigned, working all day in the damp, muddy galleries of the mine, and at night trudging through the snow back to the close, foul prison of Algachi. It was indeed worse than the life of any pariah dog, for recognizing the hopelessness of the situation, he had given way to that inertness begotten of despair. He had been toiling with his pick for nearly fourteen hours in the gloom of one of the lower galleries of the mine, when an armed warder came and told him it was time to leave. Casting down his pick, he sighed and rose from the crouching position in which he was compelled to work. The dim candlelight showed he had aged considerably. The iron fetters upon his feet clanked ominously as he walked, and upon his ragged mud-stained clothes was stitched the great yellow diamond, denoting a life sentence. Presently prisoner and warder came to the foot of the shaft, and both ascended the rickety ladders which led to the surface. At length they emerged into the light of day, and saw standing before one of the log-sheds a row of silent convicts guarded by Cossacks, waiting to be marched back to prison. Paul walked over and joined them. The wind was biting cold, and snow lay deep upon the road. <sighs> Outside the cabin of one of the convicts, of the free command, stood two well-appointed four-horse sleighs, and while the shivering men were wondering who could be travelling in this remote colony, another sleigh came rapidly along the road preceded by two mounted Cossacks. The vehicle drew up before the convicts, and its occupant, flinging off the rugs that covered him, stepped out. The men removed their hats and cheered, but Paul remained motionless. He recognized that the traveller was General Solofiev, the governor. Enveloped in a great sable-lined coat from beneath which his sword trailed in the snow, he walked with difficulty over to where the captain of the Cossacks stood. After a few minutes' conversation, the captain turned and shouted, "'Let the convict Denisov come here!' Paul stepped forward and saluted. "'Ah, yes,' said Solofiev when he saw him. "'This is the man. I knew him in Petersburg. He is very dangerous, and therefore in future he is not to go to the mines. Let him remain in the prison always. You understand?' "'Yes, Your Excellency,' replied the captain, "'wondering why such additional torture "'should be heaped on a prisoner so well behaved. "'For he was well aware that work in the mine "'was even preferable to life in the foul, overcrowded prison. "'But, Your Excellency,' protested Paul, "'I have not been mutinous, I... "'Silence!' thundered the general. "'Get back to your place!' As he turned, two persons confronted him, a man who wore an official uniform with the imperial eagle upon his cap, and a woman wrapped in a great fur-lined travelling cloak. The recognition was mutual, and in a moment he was wringing Aideen's hand. Meanwhile the man had stepped forward and, addressing the Cossack officer, said, "'Captain Yagodkin, we have not met before.' My name is Ivan Torsnev, and I am an aide-de-camp of His Majesty the Tsar. Ah, I remember you, Torsnev, cried the general, stretching forth his hand. What brings you here so far from Petersburg? An unpleasant duty, General Solofiev, replied the Tsar's messenger coldly. Taking an official document from the pocket of his greatcoat, he added, I have here a warrant from His Imperial Majesty, my august master, ordering Captain Yagodkin to release the prisoner Paul Denisov immediately, and, further, 
to arrest and detain at hard labor the governor of the Transbaikal, General Solofiev. What? cried His Excellency. You're mad! Captain Yagodkin, continued Count Torsnev, in the name of the Tsar, I hand the warrant to you. It is in His Majesty's own handwriting. Read for yourself. The Cossack officer opened it eagerly, read it through, and glanced at the imperial signature and seal. Then, addressing the governor, he said, General Solofiev, you are under arrest by order of the Tsar. What for? It has been proved by an accomplice of yours, one Sergius Varanov, replied the aide-de-camp, that you are a murderer, that with the object of eventually marrying Madame Orlovsky, you waylaid and murdered her husband. Afterwards, when she rejected your proposals of marriage, you brought circumstantial evidence to bear and accused her of the crime. In your absence, the case has been tried in Petersburg, and your sentence is hard labor in the mines for life. A few hours later, Paul and Nadine had started on the first stage of their journey back to civilization. They are now married and live happily in one of those charming villas in the pine forest at Arkachon. End of chapter 12, part 8「Chapter 9 of the Stolen Souls」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Itel Bus Stolen Souls by William Lecue Chapter 9 Vogue la Galère Part 1 Yes, yes, this is the very spot. Here the great tragedy of my life was enacted. Twenty-four weary years of my existence have passed, and until this moment I have never summoned sufficient courage to visit. How oh dear, how oh, all has changed. Paris is herself again. You may perhaps know the place near the Porte de la Moutte, a little way down the Boulevard Sachet, in the direction of Passy. The fortifications of the city recommence after the open space, which gives access to the Bois. The ponderous walls are the same, though the bridges made by the German shells have been repaired, and the stones on which I tread bear no traces of the man's blood that once made them so slippery. One hundred paces from the corner of the boulevard, there is a steep little path running up the grass-grown mound beside the railing. Ascend it, and you will find yourself on the top of the great wall, below which, deep down in the foss, on the outside towards the bois, there is a well-kept market garden. The only noises on this sunny afternoon are the twittering of birds and the rustling of leaves. Different sounds and a different outlook indeed to that which is indelibly impressed upon my memory. All are gone, gone. And I alone remain, aged, infirm, forsaken and forgotten. What matters? Though I still wear my faded scrap of yellow and green ribbon upon the lapel of my shabby coat, what matters if I am an exile, an outlaw, that here in Paris, after all these years, I dare not scribe my proper name in the register to both friends and enemies, I am dead. As I standing, looking away over the market garden, towards the shady wood, a film gathers in my eyes, and I'm carried back into the terrible past, to those black, fateful days when France lay helpless under the iron hill of the invader who had encamped it around St. Cloud and Seriousness. 
Paris fettered, existing upon black bread and horse flesh, shivered under an ice mantle, the black branches of the leafless trees over in the bois stood out distinctly against the gray storm sky and upon the ground snow was lying thickly hour after hour day after day week after week we had held those walls regardless of the hail of shell poured upon us from beyond the trees and replying with monotonous unceasing regularity hundreds of our gallant comrades were alas lying dead hundreds were in the temporary hospitals established in the neighboring churches but we the survivors half starved with the bite wind chilling our bones and so weak that our great coats felt as heavy as millstones resolved every one of us to face dead and do our duty we knew well that to hold out much longer would be impossible in those dark december days the city was starving our country had been overrun by the persian legions and sooner or later we must succumb to the inevitable the night was dark and moonless as to and fro i paced on sentry duty my post was a lonely one under the strongest portion of the wall at the point i have already indicated away in the direction of corbois there was a lurid glare in the sky showing that the enemy had committed another act of incendiarism and now and then the booming of artillery echoed like distant thunder in our quarter the guns of the enemy had ceased their fire a silence that we felt was ominous under my feet the snow crunched as i marched slowly up and down and with rifle loaded and ready for an emergency i waited patiently for relief which would come at dawn as i tramped on i thought of my home away in the center of the inert trembling city of my young wife blue-eyed fair-haired from whom i had been torn away ere our honeymoon was scarcely over how i wondered was she fairy as an advocate i had been distinctly successful have been trusted with quite a number of cause celebre but on the outbreak of war my chances of fortune had been suddenly wrecked and i had been called upon to serve with the one hundred sixty regiment of infantry first under general chancy of the loire and afterward taking part in the defence of paris though now so near the woman i loved i saw very little of her indeed i had not been able to snatch an hour to run home for the past fortnight yet while i trudged on i knew that one of the trusted and best women on earth was awaiting me at troisième in the great old house in the rue saint chavon i think that for some time i must have been oblivious to my surroundings for on turning sharply my eyes suddenly detected some indistinct object moving cautiously in the shadow something prompted me to refrain from challenging and with rifle red i quickly hurried to the spot with a cry of surprise a man in a workman's blouse sprang forward right up to the muzzle of my gun i challenged it and present my rifle hold he gasped in french in a low hoarse tone louis Anon, don't you know me have you so soon forgotten your fellow student paul albrecht the voice and the name caused me to start you i cried peering into his face and in the same darkness discovering the scar upon his cheek that he had received in the fencing school at conniga's winter you paul my best friend 
tell us that you were Prussian and we meet here as enemies. As enemies? He repeated in a strange, harsh tone. Yes, Louis, you were right, he added bitterly. As enemies. Why are you here? I inquired breathlessly. Why are you disguised as a French workman? It is my duty to arrest you. But you will not, remember? We are friends beside the Rhine, and you can only be enemies to the outside world. Surely you, of all men, will not betray me. When last I heard of you, two years ago, I said, you were a lieutenant of dragons. Tonight you are here, inside Paris, disguised. To tell the truth, he replied quickly, it's a, a love escapade. Let me get away quickly beyond the walls, and no one will know that you have detected me. See over there? And he pointed to a portion of the wall deep in the shadow. There is my fiancée. I have dared to pass through your lines to rescue her before the fine onslaught. I peered in the direction indicated, and could just distinguish a figure hidden by a cloak, and closely veiled. Quick, he continued, there is no time for reflection. If you raise an alarm, my fate is sealed. If you allow us to proceed, two lives will be made happy. Do you consent? Grasping my hand, he pressed it hard, adding, Do, Louis, for her sake. Muffled footsteps and the clank of arms broke the quiet. Three officers were approaching. Go, may God protect you, I replied, and turning sharply, tramped onward in the opposite direction, while my old friend and the woman he had rescued from starvation were a second later lost in the darkness in the direction of the Prussian camp. Scarcely had I taken a dozen paces when there were shouts, followed by shots happily exchanged. Spies! I heard one of our men exclaim. Et sacré! They've escaped. At that moment the officers, who had approached, ordered me to halt, and proceeded to question me as to whom I had been speaking with. I admitted that the man was a stranger, and that I had allowed him to pass out of the city. Thus all was discovered and I was at once arrested as a traitor, as one who had rendered assistance to a Prussian spy. The penalty was that the stern gray-haired general before whom I was taken half an hour later pronounced the sentence, and without ceremony I was hurried off to execution. Bah! Fate has always been unkind to me. It would have been better had I fallen with four of my comrades' bullets in my breast than that I should have continued to drag out an existence till today. But the bombardment had recommenced vigorously, and as I was being led along, a shell fell close to my squad, and bursting, killed two of the poor fellows and demoralized the rest. I saw my chance and darted away. A moment later I was lost among the trees. Part 2 Three hours later, breathlessly, I mounted the long flight of stairs that led to my home and opened it, the door with my key. Entering our little salon, I looked around. In the cold, gray light of dawn, the place looked unutterably cheerless and the thunder of the guns was causing the windows to rattle. Passing quickly into the bedroom, I found the ceiling open to the sky and a huge gap in the wall. A shell had fallen and completely wrecked it. Rose, I cried. Rose, I have returned. I have returned. There was no response. Another roar, like the roar of thunder, and the whole place vibrated as though as an earthquake has occurred. 
where was rose i dashed back to the salon and there upon a table i found a letter addressed to me in her familiar hand tearing it open i read eagerly the three brief lines it contained then staggered it back as if i had received a blow a second later i felt conscious of the presence of someone at my elbow and turning found mariette our maid of all work my wife where's my wife i gasped madame has gone monsieur the girl replied in her gascal accent last night the man called for her and she went out leaving a note for you a man i cried describe him what was he like i only caught one glimpse of him monsieur he was fair and had a long red scar across his cheek a scar i shrieked in dismay as the terrible truth dawned suddenly upon me rose who i had first met in cologne when a student on rhine bank had told me that i was not her first love and now i remembered that she had long ago been acquainted with my fellow student paul albrecht it was my own wife who i had assisted to elope with my enemy <sighs> time has not effaced her memory my sorrow is still as bitter today as it was in that cold december dawn with the horrors of war around me my life has become soured and my hair gray since that eventful night i have wandered in strange lands endeavoring to stifle my grief for still under sense of death as a spy i have been an exile and an outlaw until today what you ask has become of her far away in a secluded valley in the hearth under the shadow of the mystic broken there is a plain white cross in the village burying ground bearing the words rose henou 1872 my enemy paul Ulbrick, a year after the war had ended succeeded to the family title and estates and today he is one of the most prominent men in europe and acts as the diplomatic representative of germany at a certain court that must be nameless truly fate has been unkind to me today for the first time i've taken my skeleton from its cupboard would that i could bury it forever end of chapter nine vogue la galore chapter ten of stolen souls this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Stolen Souls by William Le Cue. Chapter 10. Fortune's Fool. I am no longer myself. I vanished involuntarily. Truth to tell, I was befooled by fortune. As confidential messenger in the service of the Bank of France, it was my duty to convey notes and bullion to various European capitals, and so constantly did I travel between London and Paris, and to Rome, Berlin and Vienna, that my long journeys became terribly irksome, and I longed for rest and quiet. There is much excitement and anxiety in such a life, when one is entrusted with large sums of money which are impossible to hide in one's pocket. In the year 1883, England, as is frequently the case, was remitting a quantity of gold coin to France, and consequently, during the month of June, I was making two and sometimes three journeys between Paris and London weekly. Incessant travelling, such as this, soon wearies even those inured to long railway journeys, especially if one very often has to arrive in London in the morning, only to leave again the same night. A long trip, say, to the Austrian or Turkish capitals, was much more to my taste than the wearying monotony of the Dover-Calais route, and the inevitable turmoil between Paris and the English metropolis. 
One warm night, although excessively tired, having arrived in London at an early hour that morning, I was compelled to return, and left Charing Cross by the mail train at half-past eight. I had with me a box from the Bank of England containing a large quantity of bullion. As far as Dover I was alone, smoking and dozing over a newspaper, but when I alighted on the pier the weather had changed. It rained in torrents, and a violent wind was blowing in a manner that was indicative of a dirty night. My expectations in this respect proved correct, and I was glad to arrive at Calais, where I selected an empty first-class compartment, bade the porter deposit my weighty box on the seat, and, wrapping myself comfortably in my travelling rug, set up myself for the remainder of the journey. While such a quantity of gold was in my possession, I dared not sleep, yet, fatigued as I was, I experienced great difficulty in keeping awake. It was always possible that while coin was in my custody I might be watched and followed by thieves. Therefore a loaded revolver, constantly reposed in my pocket, ready for an emergency. Few persons were travelling that night, and I was fortunate in having the compartment to myself as far as Abbeville. Then there entered two well-dressed Frenchmen, who, after scrutinising me rather closely, sank into opposite corners of the carriage. Seldom I felt uneasy regarding fellow travellers. Nevertheless, I confess that as I looked at them, I felt a strange, vague shadow of distrust. Instinctively, I felt for my revolver, assuring myself that it was ready if required. Somehow I had a suspicion that the men had been on board the channel boat and were following me for some evil purpose but they sat opposite one another, smoking, occasionally indulging in conversation, though always keeping their faces concealed as much as possible from the pale, flickering rays of the lamp overhead. As we sped south, I became more fully convinced that they meant mischief. Looking at my watch, I found that in twenty minutes we should be at Amiens, and determined to change into another carriage there. Patiently I sat, gazing out of the window, watching the grey streak of dawn break over the low, distant hills, when suddenly I felt a terrible crushing blow on the top of my skull. At the same moment I drew forth my revolver and pulled the trigger. Then a darkness fell upon me, and I remember nothing more. The sensation was horrible, the pain excruciating. It seemed as though a thousand red-hot needles were being thrust into my brain. Slowly the terrible throbbing in my head abated, and I found myself seated in an armchair in a well-furnished though unfamiliar drawing-room. It was lit by tiny electric lamps, shaded with canary silk, and as I gazed round in abject astonishment I noticed a pretty fernery beyond, which looked like a mermaid's grotto in the depths of the sea, so dense was the mass of dimly illuminated greenery. My first thoughts were of my charge, and I felt for my pouch, in which I had carried a bundle of banknotes. It was not there. Placing my hand upon my chin, I was startled to find that I had a beard, while on the previous night I had been clean-shaven. And the box of bullion! Where was that? I started to my feet, and as I did so, my figure was reflected in a long mirror. I staggered back in dismay, for, although last night I was a sprightly and spruce young man of thirty, my hair was now turning grey, and my face so aged and wrinkled that I could scarcely recognise myself. Where was I? What could it all mean? I saw a bell and rang it hastily. My summons was quickly answered by a sharp-featured man, who was evidently not a servant. Tell me, who brought me here? Whose house is this? I demanded. He gazed at me, open-mouthed, in astonishment. "'I, um, you're not well, sir, I think. This is your own house.' "'Mine?' I cried incredulously. "'Nonsense! Who are you, pray?' "'I'm your secretary,' he replied, adding, "'I, I'll return in a moment.' And then, in evident alarm, he disappeared. I had no time to reflect upon the mystery of the situation before there entered a tall, beautiful woman, of what might be termed the Genoesque type, attired in a handsome dinner-gown. 
"'Why, my dear, whatever have you been saying to Norton? You've quite frightened him!' she exclaimed, laughing. "'How is it that you're not dressed? You remember we promised to dine with the Websters tonight.' "'I—I I confess I don't understand you, madam,' I gasped, for my brain was in a whirl, and everything seemed in maddening confusion. The pain in my head was intense. "'What's the matter? What has happened?' she cried in alarm. "'Don't you recognize me? Lena, your wife!' "'My wife?' I gasped, astounded. "'No. I've never seen you before. It's some trick. Where's the box? The box that was with me in the train?' Her look of distress deepened as she said, "'Calm yourself, my dear. You are not well, and must have advice.' "'I want none,' I replied hotly. "'I desire nothing beyond the box. These are not my clothes,' I said, glancing in puzzled confusion at the coat I wore. "'Where are mine?' "'I don't comprehend your meaning,' said the handsome woman who called herself my wife. "'Your mind must be wandering, Harry.' "'That's not my name. I am Charles Dean.' "'No, no, dear,' she cried. "'You are under some strange delusion. What can have happened to you? You are Henry Methurst, and I am Lena Methurst, your wife.' "'Where and when did you marry me, pray?' "'In Cape Town, five years ago.' "'In Cape Town? And where are we now?' "'This is your house, situate, I think, to be exact, two and a half miles from Johannesburg. Is there anything else you desire to know?' she added, with a smile, half inclined to believe that I was joking. The crowd of thoughts and feelings that burst upon my mind was indescribable. Was I still myself, or was it all a delusion? No, it was a stern reality, a deep, inexplicable mystery. I married you five years ago, you say. Then what year of grace is this? Come, replied my wife. Such fooling is out of place, dear. You know as well as I that it is 1893. What? I cried feeling myself grow rigid in amazement. Yesterday was ten years ago. I was undoubtedly wide awake and sensible, but that I was really myself, I began to doubt. I struggled to comprehend the situation, but failed. How I came to be in South Africa, the possessor of such a mansion, the husband of such a wife, was a problem beyond solution. I felt light-headed, for the horrible suspense was goading me into a frenzy of madness. "'There must be some—some some serious mistake,' I said calmly. "'I have never had the pleasure of setting eyes upon you before this evening, and am utterly at a loss to understand who or what I am.' She regarded me with a terrified expression. Her face suddenly blanched, and she would have fallen had I not caught her and placed her upon the settee. Ringing the bell again, a maid-servant answered my summons. "'Your mistress has fainted. Call someone to her assistance,' I said, and then I proceeded to explore the house. It was a splendid modern mansion, and by the bright moonlight I discerned that it was surrounded by a well-kept lawn and clumps of fine old trees. I was utterly unable to realize that the journey to Paris had been made ten years before. Nevertheless, my aged appearance, my beard— the fact of my marriage and my apparent opulence all combined to confirm her statement. In vain I tried to recollect the incidents of that memorable night, but, beyond the knowledge that I received a terrible blow, I could remember nothing. Pacing in distraction in the broad terrace that ran before the house, I suddenly heard footsteps behind me. Turning, I confronted the man who called himself my secretary. Griffith! The manager of Pike's Reef has just arrived from Pretoria, and wishes to see you on important business, sir. To see me? What for? He desires instructions regarding the reef. They have struck the lead at last, and the crushings show it to be one of the richest veins in the round. Shall I bring him to you? No, I replied savagely. I want to be alone. I haven't the slightest notion of what you're talking about. Surely you know Griffith, sir. He used to manage your old mine, the Belle Fontaine, and is now in charge of Pike's Reef. I don't know him, and have no desire to make his acquaintance. 
"'Send him away,' I said abruptly. The man, who seemed puzzled, hesitated for a moment, and, after muttering some words in an undertone, re-entered the house. For nearly half an hour I had remained alone, until the maid appeared, saying, "'Mistress would like to see you in the drawing-room, sir.' I obeyed the summons, and, on entering the room, found the woman who called me husband seated on a low chair, while near her stood a short, stout old gentleman, in a frock-coat of rather ancient cut, and wearing gold-rimmed pince-nez. "'Ah, my dear Methurst!' exclaimed the man, greeting me effusively. "'How are you this evening?' "'I haven't the pleasure of knowing you, sir,' I said indifferently. "'You don't know Dr. Beale?' "'Come, come, this won't do at all,' he said, smiling. I assured him that I had never set eyes upon him before, and went on to explain how I had been travelling to Paris, and suddenly struck insensible, only to regain consciousness and find myself in Africa, rich, married, and ten years older. The doctor listened with grave attention, and subsequently we entered upon a long and rather heated discussion. All I wanted to discover was how I came to be there. "'Monomania, evidently,' observed the doctor in a low voice, when we had been talking for some time. "'It develops frequently into the most violent form of madness. You will have to be kept in seclusion and watched.' Again I resented the imputation that I was going insane, to which the medical luminary replied, "'Very well, my dear fellow, very well.' We will believe what you say. Calm yourself, for your wife is nervous and weak, remember? I turned away disgusted. All my efforts to explain the remarkable facts had only been met with incredulity by the idiotic, soft-spoken old doctor, who undoubtedly imagined I was mad. In desperation I strode out of the house, and spent the night in wandering about the grounds, and walking aimlessly through unfamiliar roads, subsequently sitting down upon the fallen trunk of a tree, where I fell asleep. When I retraced my footsteps, the bright morning sun was glinting through the foliage of the dense wood that seemed to almost surround the house. From a servant I learned that my soi-disant wife was too unwell to leave her room, and as I wandered through the place I entered one apartment which was evidently a study, my own possibly. Glancing round at the books, the two great iron safes, and the telephone instruments, I seated myself at the littered writing-table. Turning over the papers before me, I saw they related to mining enterprises involving large sums. Many of them were evidently in my handwriting, but the signatures were Henry Methurst, and the notepaper bore the heading, Great Belfontaine Gold Mines, Offices, 127 Commissioner Street, Johannesburg. Upwards of an hour I sat plunged in thought, bewildered by the events of the past few hours. I felt I must make some strenuous effort to solve the enigma, and account for the intervening ten years that I'd lost. I could not have been asleep in the manner of the legendary Rip Van Winkle, but must have been existing during the period. Yet where did I live, and how? It seemed clear from the doctor's words that if I remained I should be placed under restraint as an imbecile. Therefore, the thought suggested itself that I should return to Europe, and endeavour to find out what befell me on that midnight journey. Recollecting that I should require funds, I searched the drawers of the writing-table, and found a cash-box, in which was nearly four hundred pounds in golden notes. This was sufficient for the journey, and, with a feeling of joy, I transferred it to my pockets, and prepared for departure. A few hasty lines I wrote to my self-styled wife— informing her of my intention, and stating that I should return as soon as I had gained the information necessary to restore my peace of mind. Afterwards I went to my room, crammed a few necessaries into a travelling bag, and, without uttering a word of farewell, left the city of gold en route for England. Arrived in London, I set about tracing my career, but from the outset I found it a task fraught by many difficulties— I must have altered considerably in personal appearance during my absence, for none of my friends recognized me. There was but one agency that seemed likely to render me assistance, namely, the press. The files of the Times and Telegraph for 1883 I searched diligently, but gleaned nothing from them. 
Indeed, I spent several weeks in looking through various daily and weekly papers, published about the time of my fatal journey, without result, until one day it occurred to me that the French press might aid me. Accordingly, I went to Paris, and on the following day called at the office of the Gaulois, where I obtained the file for the year I required. Turning to the paper for the day following my sudden oblivion, my eye fell upon the headline, Terrible Accident on the Northern Railway. Eagerly I read and re-read every word, for here was what seemed a clue to the mystery. It appeared that the train in which I travelled, when approaching Longpré, ran into some trucks and was completely wrecked, seven persons being killed and about twenty injured. In a first-class compartment two passengers were discovered, one of whom had among his luggage a box containing a large sum in English gold and notes. Neither man had been injured by the accident, but one, presumably in order to obtain possession of the money, had shot his fellow-traveller dead, and was making off with booty when he was apprehended and brought to Paris. In the papers of following days I found a report of the examination before the juge d'instruction, and the subsequent trial before the assize court of the Seine. According to the newspaper accounts, the man charged with willful murder was young and well-dressed, but seemed enveloped in mystery inasmuch as he conducted himself strangely, refusing to give his name or any account of himself, and preserving an immutable silence throughout the many days the case lasted. Judging from the prominence given to the report, the trial must have been a celebrated one, and considerable excitement was created in the French capital, owing to the fact that several prominent members of the medical profession, who had examined the accused, agreed that he was suffering from some strange mental affection, the precise nature of which they were unable to discover. It was owing to this that the culprit escaped the guillotine, being sentenced to hard labour for life, and transportation to the penal colony of New Caledonia. Which was I, the murderer or the murdered? I felt confident I was one or the other. Therefore I resolved to find out whether this mysterious convict was still alive, and if so, to seek an explanation from him. The thought occurred to me that an official in the prison's department, whom I had known, might be able to furnish me with the information. After some difficulty I discovered him, but he had long ago retired into private life. So entirely had my personal appearance changed that he did not recognize me. Therefore, by representing that I was an English solicitor, anxious to discover a next of kin, and offering to pay handsomely for the investigation, I prevailed upon him to seek an interview with the chief of the department, and ascertain whether the convict was still living. When I called a few days later, he placed in my hands a memorandum, signed by the chief, certifying that, after two years at La Nouvelle, as the French prison island is termed, prisoner number 8469, committed for life for murder, had effected his escape by means of an open boat, in company with Jean Montbazon, who had been convicted of forging Spanish bonds. Both were known to have landed on the Queensland coast after a perilous voyage, but they disappeared before the Australian police were communicated with, and all efforts to trace them had been futile. Having, however, been employed in the government mines near Noumea, it was expected that they had obtained work in one of the remote mining districts, where they could effectively hide until the search was over. To find this man Montbazon was no easy task, but if I chanced to be successful, he might, I thought, tell me something of his whilom comrade in adversity. I was puzzled how to proceed, but at length resorted to advertising as the only expedient. In the chief French and colonial newspapers I caused to be inserted a brief paragraph addressed to Jean Montbazon, late of Noumea, stating that his companion upon the voyage from New Caledonia to Australia wished particularly to meet him, and giving my address at the Table Bay Hotel, Cape Town, whither I proceeded. Patiently I awaited a reply, but although I had spent a large sum upon the advertisement, it apparently failed to reach the man whose acquaintance I desired to make. For many weeks I remained at the hotel, feeling no desire to return to Johannesburg, until I had cleared up the mystery and accounted for my lost identity. 
times without number i was tempted to relinquish the effort to trace my past yet with sheer dogged perversity i remained and hoped at last my patience was rewarded for one evening while i was sitting on the balcony of the hotel enjoying a cigar in the starlight the waiter brought me a visitor judge my dismay when i recognized the face of my secretary well old fellow he exclaimed familiarly and what means all this confounded mystery i sat speechless in amazement i saw the advertisement in the cape times and concluding that something was wrong came down here what is it he continued sinking lazily into a chair by my side the advertisement i gasped i i don't understand you your advertisement was addressed to jean montbazon your humble and obedient servant who shared your lot at la nouvelle and who escaped with you what i cried is that true i think mon cher ami you must have taken leave of your senses as madame declares you have come now what's the matter are are you really jean montbazon that's my baptismal cognomen though fred norton suits me better just now look here i said earnestly i admit i'm not quite myself indeed i have forgotten everything tell me how we escaped and why I am so rich, while you are my secretary. The man looked at me incredulously, remarking, Ma foi, I thought you were a bit vacant before you left Johannesburg so mysteriously, but you now seem stark mad. It would take a long time to recount all our adventures, and some would be rather unpleasant reminiscences. You were sent to penal servitude for life, for murder, and I for forgery. We were pals in the same labor gang and one day finding an open boat upon the beach we resolved to escape and embarked in the boat was a keg of water and a barrel of biscuits which sufficed to keep body and soul together until after a terrible voyage lasting many days we ran ashore near port curtis in queensland having regained our freedom we tramped to the gold diggings and worked together for about a year you had extraordinary luck and soon became rich while i was often obliged to exist upon your charity in a year however an unfortunate incident occurred at our camp at gumtree gulch a man who was known to have a quantity of dust in his belt was found dead with an ugly wound upon his head and in consequence of this australia became too warm for you and i therefore we left the camp hurriedly one night without wishing adieu to our comrades and came here to south africa to try our luck as usual your good fortune did not desert you already rich you bought some big claims in the runt and worked them with almost incredible results then the boom came and how did that affect me you had previously married a wealthy woman before the gold fever set in when the boom came you sold both her property and yours at such prices that within three weeks you were almost a millionaire what am i now i asked amazed at this remarkable story you are owner of two of the richest gold workings in the transvaal and i always a lazarus am your confidential secretary most confidential i assure you he added smiling the master a murderer, the servant a forger. Having thus filled up the long blank in my memory, I did not rest until I had satisfactorily accounted for the events of that fateful night. Subsequently, I discovered that the violent blow on my head, received in the accident, had produced such an effect on my brain as to render oblivious all the events of my past. From that moment I commenced a second life. One of my fellow passengers, noticing my injury, was endeavouring to steal the box of bullion when I shot him dead with my revolver. Afterwards, when I had recovered consciousness, I opened the box, and, secreting part of the money in my pockets, tried to get away unobserved. But I was arrested, tried for murder, and transported. The rest is known. At my trial I refused to give any account of myself, for the simple reason that I remembered nothing. My mind was an absolute blank. 
I had lived an entirely different life for ten years, until I accidentally struck my head a violent blow against the corner of a mantel shelf in my drawing room, causing the memory of my earlier life to return as suddenly as it had fled, and thus leaving a gap of ten years for me to fill. Mine was an extraordinary case, but, as I afterwards discovered, my duality of brain was by no means unprecedented. Such vagaries of the mind, although rare, are known to medical science. When, a week afterwards, I returned to Johannesburg, that dusty, noisy city of Mammon, Lena welcomed me warmly. The same evening, after I had explained to her the cause of my sudden disappearance and apparent insanity, she went to her room, and, on her return, handed me a faded blue envelope, secured by the official seal of the Bank of England. "'This,' she said, "'you asked me to keep for you on the day we were married.' I glanced at the superscription and recognized the handwriting. It contained the lost banknotes. Placing them in the fire, I watched the flames consume them, and from that night I commenced life afresh. Jean is my secretary no longer. I effected a compromise with him, and at the present moment, owing to his shrewd business tact, combined with successful speculation, he is one of the most prosperous promoters of the South African mining companies in the city of London. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of Stolen Souls》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Stolen Souls》by William Lequeur Chapter Eleven — Death Kisses The scene was composed of a bit of everything. An October evening, a dull sky, a fierce wind, and a woman. Yet the dreamy experience, where everything went at will, bears but little resemblance to reality. The woman was sweet and tender, the interview passionate yet innocent, and the words exchanged naive as the questions of a child. The recollection of it leaves no poison of deception, only indelible remorse. It was a chill, windy afternoon. In the morning a great thirst for fresh air had taken possession of me, and I joyfully left Brussels, counting on stopping at a little station I knew. I think my journey terminated about four o'clock. Cutting across the fields, I entered a narrow path, paying but little attention to the way, and strolling aimlessly. I seemed to be in an incredibly careless and absent mood that day. I am not even certain that I got out at the right station, so drunk was I with the frenzy to communicate with nature. Picture to yourself a rolling plain under a cheerless sky, with empty roads cut in the brown earth, here and there made green with tender shoots, a few solitary and distant houses, and occasional stumps of leafless trees, red and melancholy looking. A flight of crows sailed slowly overhead, talking among themselves with little continuous croakings, flying always towards the setting sun. The day was gray, with deeper shades towards the horizon, stamping everything with a uniform tint. Children's voices sounded in the field. Suddenly three appeared, a boy and two girls, returning from school. They grew silent when they saw me, eyed me cautiously, and crossed the path with quickened step. Soon I reached an isolated crossroad. A step further, and I encountered a strolling mountebank, with his wheeled home beside him. At my request he furnished me with a slight repast. Then, without saying a dozen words, I set off again, leaving the astonished man gaping at the money in his hand. You say that I was mad. Perhaps. At any rate, I was quite calm. But something evidently dominated and guided me, for of the three roads that spread out before me, why should I have chosen that one? I assure you I have no spiritualistic tendencies, but there are times when I believe in a distant influence. The night had fallen, or rather a sort of twilight, singularly lasting. A fine cold rain, driven by a brisk wind, beat noisily upon my umbrella. I wandered slowly on, holding it against the wind, I walked without effort. I think I must have slept, as I have only a vague recollection of that dreary promenade. 
When I became aware of things around me, I was in front of a good fire. There was a dim consciousness of realizing that the storm had redoubled its fury, that I had seen a light and knocked at a cottage door. As I recovered from the stupor, it seemed as if I had entered with some trivial formula of politeness, that I had seated myself in front of the genial flame as if I were in my own home. A young woman, pale but very beautiful, was sitting beside me. I glanced slowly around the room. We were alone. Little by little I remembered. It was she who had opened the door to me. Behold, even the card I gave her still in her hand. Were it not for her light breathing and the movement of her eyelids, I should say she was of wax. She was older than myself, two or three years perhaps, tall and slight, with a gentle and melancholy grace. Her mouth, clear and tender, was near enough to the delicate nose to give her a slight appearance of a scolded child. The eyes were not large, but soft and pleading, and the oval of her face stretched the length of her blanched cheeks. Though sad, the face pleased me. How charming! I exclaimed involuntarily under my breath. She must have heard the words, for she turned towards me and smiled. You are just as complimentary as of old, always the same, Theophile. In that voice I found an air of recognition. Instantly I remembered a half-forgotten period, like a pleasant dream. A name was upon my lips, but I could not utter it. I stammered a question. Well, well, she said. They tell me I have altered, yet why don't you know Mariette? Mariette! Mariette! Only this thought, and I fell on my knees beside her. Her hands touched, and I kissed her dainty white fingers. Why was I certain in all my life never to know a like moment? Ah, never shall I experience the same mad joy, the delight of holding in mine the thin hands of my childhood's friend. It was that childhood I embraced, that other time so free and pure, with its pretty welcoming air. "'Do you remember when last we met?' I asked earnestly. She heaved a slight sigh, so like those of other days that tears rose to my eyes. "'Yes,' she murmured. "'But there, don't speak of it. Such memories must be painful to both of us.' "'If to you, none the less to me, Mariette,' I replied, looking in her sad, sweet face. Her lips quivered, and a tear stole down her cheek. During a whole hour it was nothing but expressions of surprise and vain regrets. To the depths of our being we felt the force of these recollections, causing us to live over an almost forgotten period. I found in looking at her, in listening to her, my great soul and little body of that sweet other time. Once more I felt the immensity of the fields and of the sky. The fine smell of the leaves enthralled my senses, and the least sound was melody. Once more I lived the old free life over again. It was before I went to stay at Brussels, when I resided under the paternal roof on the edge of the dense Soignier forest, that Mariette and I were playmates and afterwards lovers. How well I recollect one halcyon day, the memory of which now comes before me in all its vividness. It was autumn. We were walking alone in the wood. The leaves floated down noiselessly upon the chill November air, leaving the naked branches like black lace against a gray, snow-laden sky. That day she admitted that she loved me, and she would be my wife. And all around us there was infinite space, colored by the joyful imaginings of happy youth. We were speaking of it when suddenly she withdrew her hand from mine, and a red flush mounted to her forehead. "'But you soon forgot me when you went away,' she said reproachfully. "'I waited months, but you never wrote. "'Then I heard how an actress had infatuated you. "'Yet you are rich now, and the world looks leniently "'upon what it calls a wealthy man's folly.' "'I could not prevent myself from frowning. "'You mean Clementine Sucaret? "'People coupled our names without cause,' I replied coldly, almost cruelly. "'Yet I knew she spoke the truth.' "'Am I, am I mad?' she whispered. I rose and looked at her. She was still seated, her eyes riveted upon the fire, her cheek resting upon my hand, appearing to have forgotten my presence. For a moment I remained in that position, then I reseated myself. There was nothing awkward in our silence. We felt too deeply for idle words. As we contemplated our past, the wind whistled without, the rain fell furiously, and from time to time I added a log to the fire and stirred the embers. 
Theophile, she exclaimed suddenly, looking me straight in the face, it is your fault that I am married. Married? I gasped in amazement. I, I thought this cottage was your aunt's, that you kept house for her. There was a silence. The voice made me tremble, gay, careless idler that I was. She spoke slowly, without moving, as though giving utterance to the thought that possessed her. When a woman is forsaken by the man she loves, who can blame her for a hasty, loveless marriage? she asked. You wrecked my life, Theophile, but I forgive you freely. After you had left, I was stricken down with grief, madness followed, and I accepted the first man who proposed to me. I did not love him, I, I shall never love him, and how could I? He is a dissolute ne'er-do-well, who spends his days in the estaminet, drinking cognac. It is I who am compelled to toil and earn money for him to spend and drink. Ah, Theophile, you little know how dull and utterly hopeless is my life. But your husband? Does he not try and make you happy? I asked. Happy? she cried, jumping to her feet and impetuously tearing open the bodice of her dress. See, see here, the marks of his violence where he tried to murder me and she disclosed to my view her delicate breast, disfigured by an ugly knife wound, only partially healed. Horrible! I exclaimed, with an involuntary shudder. That is not all, she continued, turning up her sleeves and revealing cruel bruises and lacerations upon her alabaster-like arms. He wants to rid himself of me, to be free again, and when the brandy takes effect, he threatens to kill me. Why stay and be brutally ill-used in this manner? I asked. Shrugging her shoulders, she smiled sadly, replying, If I were dead, it would end my misery. Should he ever know that you have been here, his jealousy would be so aroused that I believe he would carry his threat into effect. Come, come, Mariette, you must not talk like that, I exclaimed. It grieves me to know of your unhappiness, to think that I am to blame. Remember, I forgive you. Yes, but try to bear up against it. Do your duty to your husband, and thus compel him to treat you kindly. I have tried to do so, heaven knows, she replied hoarsely, bursting into tears. But everything is useless. Only death can release me. Don't talk so gloomily, I urged, taking one of her cold hands in mine. Although we can be naught to one another, save friends, let me be yours. I am ready to do anything you command me. You are kind, Theophile, very kind, she replied bitterly, shaking her head but friendship is poor reparation for love. I thought of the years we had passed together at the time when years are so long and beautiful. Finally I said to her, Tell me, what can I do for you? She made no answer, only her face appeared to grow a shade paler. With her eyes on the clock, she seemed to listen. Nothing, she replied at last. You, you must go. So soon? Yes, she said with a choking sob, you ought not to have come here, and, and you must forgive me, Theophile. We women are so weak when memories are painful. She wished to aid me in my preparations for departure, handed me my hat and buttoned my coat. We said nothing, but she lingered over the buttoning as though it were something very difficult. Suddenly, with a bitter burst of tears, she flung her head down against my arm. She seemed such a frail little creature as I held her tightly, and stroked away the tendril curls that strayed across her face. I longed to console her, but could not give utterance to my thoughts. Mariette, my poor little Mariette, was all I could say. Goodbye, Theophile, goodbye, she whispered brokenly. A great gulf separates us. You have gaiety and happiness. I have only misery and despair. My husband, just as suddenly as they commenced, her tears ceased. Clasping her hands, she lifted her agitated face to mine. Promise me, promise me you will never return here again. I did not reply. Bending over, her lips met mine in one fierce, passionate caress. Next second we were startled by a strange noise, sounding suspiciously like a footstep upon the gravel. We listened, but the sound was not repeated. Hark! she whispered anxiously. If my husband should find you here, would it not compromise me? With a force I should never have suspected, she led me to the door, and after giving me a gentle push, locked it behind me. Adieu, I murmured, as tenderly as I could. There was no answer. 
Through the keyhole I could see Mariette kneeling before a crucifix on the opposite wall. Then I turned and went forward into the darkness. The morning was gray and dispiriting. The chill wind whirled the dead leaves in my path and moaned through the bare branches as I walked up to the door of the cottage. My mind was perturbed by thoughts of what happiness might have resulted had I been true to the woman who loved me. I had spent a restless night at a roadside inn. Her misery tortured me, and, despite her entreaty, I was now on my way to again proffer assistance. With trepidation I approached the door of the humble abode and knocked. No one stirred. Everything seemed strangely silent. About to repeat the summons, I noticed the door was ajar. Pushing it slowly open, I entered, at the same time uttering her name. As I stepped into the neat, well-kept room, I at first saw nothing, but on glancing round the opposite side of the table, my eyes encountered a terrible sight. Stretched upon the floor, Mariette was lying partly dressed, the pale light falling upon her upturned features. The cheeks and lips were bloodless. The eyes, wide open, were staring wildly into space with a look of indescribable horror. Falling upon my knees, I touched her face with my hand. It was cold as marble. She was dead. In her white breast a knife was buried up to the hilt, and from the cruel wound the blood had oozed. She had been murdered. The recollection of the events immediately following this ghastly discovery is but faint. I have a hazy belief that my mind became temporarily unhinged, that I left the place without informing anyone of the tragedy. Then, walking many miles through the forest, I reached a railway station, whence I returned to Brussels. The one thing most in my mind was the terrible look of blank despair in the glazed eyes. I have never forgotten it. I shall carry its remembrance with me to the grave. That awful look of reproach has ever since been uppermost in my memory. Try how I will, I cannot rid myself of its hideous presence. A bright, crisp morning in December. Hurrying down the Montagne de la Cour, where I chanced to have business, I came face to face with Clementine Sucarette, who, warmly clad in furs, was enjoying that harmless pastime so dear to the feminine heart, inspecting shop windows. We had bid each other farewell three years before. She then left Brussels to fulfill engagements as a dancer in London and Paris, and since I heard nothing of her. Greeting me with the same winsome smile and merry manner as of old, she inquired whither I was going. When I explained that my business was important and did not admit of delay, she requested that she might accompany me, at the same time inviting me to déjeuner with her afterwards, an arrangement to which I consented without reluctance. As we walked together, she commenced describing her adventures and successes, declaring that, after all, it was pleasant to return among old friends and cherished recollections. I was well aware at what she hinted when she said this, for I was one of her oldest friends, and had known her when she was only a figurante at the Théâtre de la Monnaie, and lived with her decrepit and bibulous old father, a concierge in the Rue des Trones. It was then that her cheerful, good-natured disposition and handsome face had fascinated me, causing me to forsake Mariette. The thought inflicted a sharp twinge of remorse, for the tragedy in the little cottage was still fresh in my memory. Having left her for a moment when I made a call, I rejoined her. Laughing and chattering, she chaffingly alluded to our former attachment, and pouted in feigned displeasure at what she termed my inconstancy. Down the Rue de la Régence we had sauntered slowly, and were passing the imposing façade of the Palais de Justice, when suddenly she stopped, and, uttering an exclamation of surprise at the proportions of the vast building, which had been completed in her absence, requested me to take her to see the interior. Mounting the broad flight of granite steps, we passed into the magnificent marble hall. Strange how fate is constantly our mistress and rules our every action. We had crossed under the gilded dome, and were about to enter one of the courtrooms, when my eye caught a large printed notice fixed to the wall. I halted and read. It was an imposing poster, headed in great black capitals, Court of Assize, and was the public announcement that Henri Pirlot had been sentenced to death by that tribunal for the willful murder of his wife Mariette at a cottage near Spoil. It further stated that the condemned man had confessed that the cause of the crime was jealousy. 
He was intoxicated, and having discovered his wife kissing a strange man who had visited her in his absence, he went in and deliberately stabbed her to the heart. "'What a pair of idiots!' exclaimed Clementine, with a light laugh, as she read the notice. "'The idea of killing a woman because she kissed her lover!' Again, what a simpleton the woman was not to have been more wary. But, why, what's the matter, Theophile? You stand there gazing and looking as scared as if you'd seen a ghost. Anyone would think you knew the rustic beauty, and were the strange lover. I started. A sickening sensation crept over me. The actress had little idea it was the terrible truth she uttered. I pleaded that I was not feeling well, and we left the building. End of chapter 11. Recording by Lee Smalley. Chapter 12 of Stolen Souls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Stolen Souls by William Le Cue. Chapter 12 The City in the Sky In the mystic haze of the slowly dying day, a solitary Arab, mounted on a meheri, or swift camel, and carrying his long rifle high above his head, rode speedily over the great silent wilderness of treacherous, ever-shifting sand. Once he drew rein, listening attentively, and turning his keen dark eyes to the left, where the distant serrated crests of the mountains of Nanagama loomed forth like giant shadows. But as nothing broke the appalling stillness, he sped forward again, until at length he came to a small oasis, where, under a clump of palms, he made his camel kneel, and then dismounted. As he stalked towards the lonely shrine of Sidi Yokba, a small domed building constructed of sun-dried mud under which reposed the remains of one of the most venerated of arab marabouts he looked a young and muscular son of the desert whose merry bronzed face bore an expression of genial good nature that was unmistakable notwithstanding the fact that he belonged to the fiercest race of bedouins tall and erect he strode with an almost regal gait even though his burnous was brown ragged and travel-stained. The hake that surrounded his face was torn and soiled, and upon his bare feet were rough, heavy slippers that were sadly the worse for wear. The latter, however, he kicked off on approaching the shrine. Then, kneeling close to the sun-blanched wall, he cast sand upon himself, kissed the earth, and, drawing his palms down his face, repeated the testification in fervent supplication he bowed repeatedly, and, raising his voice until it sounded distinct on the still air, invoked the blessing of Allah. O merciful, O beneficent granter of requests, he cried, O king of the day of faith, guide us, ere to-morrow's sun hath run its course, into the path that is straight, and leadeth unto the kasbah of our enemies of Abaya. Strengthen our arms, Lead us in times of darkness and in the hours of day. Destroy our enemies and let them writhe in al Hawayat, the place prepared for infidels, where their meat shall be venomous serpents, and they shall slake their thirst with boiling pitch. Startled suddenly by a strange sound, he listened with bated breath. The thought occurred to him that his words might have been overheard by some spy, and instinctively his hand drew from his belt his jambaya, the long, crooked dagger that he always carried. Again, a noise like a deep-drawn sigh broke the silence, and Hatita, for such was the young Arab's name, sprang to his feet and rushed round to the opposite side of the building, just in time to see a fluttering white robe disappearing in the gloom. With the agility of a leopard, the man of Kanuri, the most daring of the slave-trading tribes in the great Sahara, sprang toward it, and in twenty paces had overtaken the eavesdropper, who, with a slight scream, fell to earth beneath his heavy hand. Rise, he cried, roughly dragging the figure to its feet, thou son of Eblis. Next second, however, he discovered that the fugitive was a woman, 
veiled and enshrouded in her hake and wearing those baggy white trousers that render all arab females hideous when out of doors thou hast overheard my orison he cried raising his knife speak speak or of a verity will i strike but the mysterious woman uttered no word and hatita in a frenzy of desperation tore the veil from her face aghast he stood and the knife fell from his fingers the countenance revealed was amazingly beautiful so charming indeed that instantly he became entranced by its loveliness and stood speechless and abashed she was not more than eighteen and her features fair as an englishwoman's were regular with a pair of brilliant dark eyes set well apart under brows blackened by coal and a forehead half hidden by strings of golden sequins that tinkled musically each time she moved upon her head was set jauntily a little scarlet chachia trimmed heavily with seed pearls while her neck was encircled by strings of roughly cut jacinths and turquoises and in the folds of her silken hake were clung the subtle perfumes of the harem slowly she lifted her fine eyes still wet with tears to his and with her breast rising and falling quickly trembled before him fearing his wrath loosen thy tongue strings he cried at last grasping her slim white wrists with his rough hard hand thou art from afo the city in the sky and thou hast gained knowledge of our intended attack thy lips o stranger speak the truth she faltered why art thou here and alone so far from thine home on the crest of yonder peak he inquired gazing at her in wonderment i came hither for the same purposes as thyself she answered seriously looking straight into his face to crave allah's blessing art thou a dweller in the house of grief he asked tell me why thou didst venture here alone she hesitated toying nervously with the jewelled perfume bottle suspended at her breast then she answered i i am betrothed to a man i hate the merciful giver of blessings alone can rescue me from a fate that is worse than death a marriage without love and who is forcing thee into this hateful union if it is thy father tell me his name yes it is my father abudel jalil ben saif anaza sultan of abaya the sultan he cried in amazement then thou art kira he added for the extraordinary beauty of the only daughter of the sultan of abaya was proverbial throughout the great desert from lake sud to the atlas yes she replied and from thy speech and dress i know thou art of the kanuri our deadliest enemies true answered the desert pirate to-morrow my tribe to a number of ten thousand now lying concealed in the valley called Deforu, will swarm upon thine impregnable city and ten thousand she gasped pale and agitated and thou wilt kill my father and reduce our people to slavery ah no she added imploringly save us o stranger our fighting men went south one moon ago to collect the taxes at jagada therefore we are unprotected what can i do how can i act to save my father dost thou desire to save him even though he would force upon thee this odious marriage i do she cried i i will save the city in the sky at cost of mine own life to whom art thou betrothed hatita asked tenderly taking her hand to the aga hassan Erawi, who dwelleth at zugra beyond nanagama he is threescore years and ten and tis said he treateth his wife with inhuman cruelty one of his slaves told me so hatita stood silent and thoughtful though he was a member of a tribe who existed wholly upon loot obtained from caravans and towns they attacked yet so earnestly did the sheikh's daughter appeal that all thought of preserving the secret of the intended attack by murdering her disappeared and he found himself deeply in love his was a poor chance however he told himself the proud sultan of abaya would never consent to a brigand as a son-in-law even if kira known popularly as the light of the eyes of the discerning looked upon him with favour to-night o daughter of the sun we meet as friends to-morrow as enemies 
Our spies have reported that thy city remaineth undefended, and, alas, there is a blood feud between my people and thine. Therefore, when the hosts of the Kanuri enter with fire and sword, few, I fear, will be spared. Wilt thou not remain here with my tribesmen and escape? No, she answered proudly. I am a woman of Afo, and I will return unto my people, even though I fall before tomorrow's sundown under thy merciless swords. As she spoke, one hand rested upon her supple hip, and with the other she pointed to the high shadowy peak whereon stood the great white stronghold known to the Arabs as the city in the sky. But thou, who art like a sun among the stars, knowest our plans, and it is my duty to kill thee, he said, hitching his burnous about his broad shoulders. I am in thine hands. If thou stainest them with my blood, thou wilt ever have upon thy conscience the remembrance that thou hast taken the life of one who was innocent of intrigue. If thou givest me freedom, I shall have at least one brief hour of felicity with my people before, before, and she sighed without concluding the sentence. Thou, a fresh rose from the fountainhead of life, art in fear of a double fate, the downfall of to-morrow and the marriage feast next moon. Let not thy mind be troubled, for I stretch not forth the tongue to blame, he said at last, endeavouring to smile. In Hatita, son of Ibrahim, thou hast a devoted friend, and one who may peradventure assist thee in a manner thou hast not dreamed. Therefore, mount thine horse and return with all speed to Afo, not, however, before thou hast given me some little souvenir of this strange meeting. Thou slakest my thirst with the beverage of kindness, she cried in joy. I knew when first I saw thee that thou wert my friend. Friend? Nay, lover, he answered gallantly, as, taking her tiny hand again, he pressed her henna-stained nails softly to his lips. She blushed and tried to draw away, but he held her firmly, until she withdrew one of her gold bangles from her wrist, and with a smile placed it upon his. Behold, she exclaimed with a merry rippling laugh, it is thy badge of servitude to me. I am slave of the most handsome mistress in the world, he said happily. Then, urging her to warn the sultan of the intentions of the Kanuri, he kissed her once tenderly upon the lips, lifted her into the saddle of her gaily caparisoned horse, and then she twisted her torn veil about her face, and, giving him peace, sped away swift as an arrow into the darkness, bearing intelligence that would cause the utmost sensation in the mountain fastness. "'I love her,' murmured Hatita, when the sound of her horse hoofs had died away. "'But how can I save her? Tomorrow, when we enter Afo and loot the palace, she will be secured to grace our sheikh's harem." No, he cried with a fierce, guttural imprecation. She shall never fall into Nikali's brutal hands, never while I have breath. The sound of whispering caused him to fix his gaze upon a dark shadow thrown by some ethel bushes, and next second half a dozen men similarly attired to himself advanced. So, dog of a spy, thou hast betrayed us, cried a voice, which in a moment he was startled to recognize as that of Mohammed el Spaski a Kaid of his tribe. Yes, the others shouted with one accord. We watched the son of Offal speaking with the woman, and we overheard him telling her to warn the sultan. Follow her on the wings of haste, cried the Kaid. Kill her, for death alone will place the seal of muteness upon the lips of such a jade. And in a few seconds two white-robed figures bolted into their saddles and tore past in the direction Kira had disappeared. Speak! thundered El Spassky, who with the others had now surrounded him. Knowest thou the punishment of traitors? Yes, answered Hatita hoarsely. Who is the woman whose blackness and deceit hath captivated thee? Three rapid shots sounded in the distance. The Arabs had evidently overtaken and murdered the daughter of the Sultan. The young tribesman held his breath. I, I refuse to give the answer he said resolutely. By Allah, thou art a traitor to our lord Nikali, and of a verity thou hast also Ainul Kamal, therefore thou shalt die. The eye of perfection, or evil eye, is considered by the Arabs to be so maleficent that it can not only injure but kill a person. 
Then, turning to the others, he added, We have no time to bandy words with this accursed son of the evil one. Tie him to yon tree, and let the vultures feast upon their carrion. With loud imprecations, the men seized their clansmen, tore off his hake and burnous, and bound him securely to a palm trunk, in such a position that he could only see the great expanse of barren sand. Then, with that refinement of cruelty, of which the nomadic canuri are past masters, they smeared his face, hands, and feet with date juice, to attract the ants and other insects. And after jeering at him, and condemning him to everlasting perdition, and sempiternal culpability, they remounted their horses, and, laughing heartily, left him alone to await the end. Through the long, silent night, Hatita, with arms and legs bound so tightly that he could not move them, remained wondering what terrible fate had befallen the beautiful girl who had overheard his orison. The two Arabs had not returned. He knew the men were splendid riders, therefore it was more than probable that they had very quickly overtaken her. Utterly hopeless, well knowing that to the blazing sun and the agonies of being half devoured by insects he must very soon succumb, he waited, his ears on the alert to catch every sound. In the sky, a saffron streak showed on the edge of the sandy plain, heralding the sun's coming. He watched it gradually spread, knowing that each moment brought him nearer to an end of agony. He lifted his voice in supplication to Allah, and showered voluble curses upon the expedition about to be attempted by his tribe. The pale, handsome face of Kira was ever before him, haunting him like a half-remembered dream, its beauty fascinating him, and even causing him to forget the horror of those hours of dawn. Saffron changed to rose, and rose to gold, until the sun shone out, lighting up the trackless waste. The flies, awakened, began to torment the condemned man, who knew that the merciless rays beating down upon his uncovered head would quickly produce the dreaded delirium of madness. The furnace heat of sunshine grew intense as noon approached, and he was compelled to keep his eyes closed to avoid the blinding glare. Suddenly a noise fell upon his ear. At first it sounded like a low, distant rumbling, but soon his practised ears detected that it was the rattle of musketry and din of tom-toms. The city in the sky was being attacked. His tribesmen had arranged to deliver the assault at noon, but what puzzled him was a sullen booming at frequent intervals. It was the sound of cannon, and showed plainly that Alpho was being defended. From where he was he could see nothing of it. Indeed, the base of the mountain was eight miles distant, and the city, perched upon its summit, could only be approached from the opposite side by a path that was almost inaccessible. Yet hour after hour the rapid firing continued, and it was evident a most desperate battle was being fought. This puzzled him, for had not Kira said that the city was totally undefended? Still, the tumult of battle served to prevent him from lapsing to unconsciousness, and not until the sun sank in a brilliant blood-red blaze did the firing cease. Then all grew silent again. The hot poison wind from the desert caused the feathery heads of the palms to wave like funeral plumes, and night crept on. The horrible torture of the insects, the action of the sun upon his brain, the hunger, the thirst, and the constant strain of his nerves proved too much, and he slept, haunted by spectral horrors, and a constant dread of the inevitable, the half-consciousness precursory of death. So passed the night until the sun reappeared, but Hatita's eyes opened not. The heat of the blazing noon caused him no concern, neither did the two grey vultures that were hovering over him, for it was not until he heard voices in the vicinity that he gazed around. One voice, louder than the others, was uttering thanks to Allah. He listened, then, summoning all his strength that remained, he cried aloud in the name of the One Merciful for assistance. There were sounds of hurrying footsteps, voices raised in surprise, a woman's scream, and then objects grotesquely distorted whirled around him, and he knew no more. When Hatita again opened his weary, fevered eyes, he was amazed to find himself lying upon a soft, silken divan 
in a magnificent apartment with slaves watching ready to minister to his wants he took a cooling draught from a crystal goblet handed to him then raised himself and inquired where he was the slaves made no reply but bowing low left then in a few moments the frou-frou of silk startled him and the next second he leaped to his feet and with a cry of joy clasped kira in his arms in her gorgeous harem dress of pale rose silk with golden bejeweled girdle she looked bewitching though around her eyes were dark rings that betrayed the anxiety of the past few days as their lips met in hot passionate kisses she was followed by a tall stately dark bearded man of matchless bearing whose robe was of amaranth silk and who wore in his headdress a magnificent diamond aigrette kira saw him and withdrawing herself from her tita's embrace introduced her lover to her father the sultan of abaya to thee i owe my life and my kingdom said the potentate giving him peace and wringing his hand warmly kira hath related unto me the mercy thou didst show towards her and it was thy word of warning that enabled us to repel and defeat the kanuri then thou didst escape o signet of the sphere of elegance the young arab cried turning to the sultan's daughter yes though i was hard pressed by two of thine horsemen i took the secret path and thus they were baffled the director of fate apprised our fighting men of their danger said the sultan and they returned on the same night the breeze of grace blew the sun of favor of allah shone the news brought by kira was quickly acted upon and the defences of the city so strengthened that when at noon the assault was delivered our cannons swept thy tribesmen from the pass like grains of sand before the sirocco for six hours they fought but their attempts to storm the city gate were futile and the handful of survivors were compelled to retire leaving nearly a thousand prisoners including nikali himself in our hands and how was i rescued hatita asked after briefly explaining how his conversation with kira had been overheard on the day following the fight we went unto the shrine of sidi Akbar to return thanks to allah and there found thee dying of heat and thirst thou didst sacrifice thy life to save our ruler and his city therefore we brought thee hither she said and as a reward added the sultan smiling upon them both i give unto thee my daughter kira in marriage then taking their hands he placed them in each other's and added thou hast both the verdure of the meadow of life may allah preserve thee and grant unto thee long years of perfect peace and an eternal rose garden of happiness in order that thou shalt have position fitting the husband of thy sultan's daughter i have ordered our palace of kayukoi to be prepared for thy reception therefore wipe off the rust of ennui and fatigue from the speculum of thy mind and follow me for a feast is already prepared for the celebration of this betrothal and the happy pair hand in hand passed onward through the private pavilions bewildering in their magnificence of marble and gold and green with many leaves to the great hall of the divan where standing under the royal baldachin of yellow silk brocade the sultan of abaya rejoiced them with his favours proclaiming hatita son of ibrahim as the future husband of kira and appointing him governor of the city in the sky end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen part one of stolen souls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org stolen souls by william le Cue. chapter thirteen the blood red band part one a series of exciting adventures that befell me four years ago were remarkable and puzzling until quite recently i have regarded the mystery as impenetrable indeed in this fin de siècle decade it is somewhat difficult to comprehend that such events could have occurred or that the actors could have existed in real life i was in piedmont at the little village of Bartonetia, 
a quaint rural place comprising a few picturesque chalets an inn and a church with a bulgy spire which nestles in the fertile valley at the foot of the towering snow-capped mont Cenis. i was staying at the inn and i wished to go to lancelburg on the opposite side of the mountain intending to travel thence by diligence to grenoble where i had arranged to meet some friends but i needed a guide the bypaths in the cotian alps are rough and intricate and he would be a daring spirit who would venture to cross the sanus alone away from the beaten track there was not a single mule to be hired and the only guide i could find refused to carry my valise so i was in danger of missing my appointment i could of course have gone by train through the tunnel to modane but that route would have taken me many miles out of my way therefore i had decided upon the shorter road at evening while i stood at dusk at the door of the inn looking anxiously to see whether any guide or porter had returned from the mountains the innkeeper told me he had found a man does he come from the valley i asked no signore from the mountains impossible i should have seen him i have been watching the path for an hour this man does not follow the same path as the others why but my host vouchsafed no further explanation he only called with a loud voice giovanni the guide appeared he was tall muscular and rather strange-looking about thirty years old the wrinkles of his face giving an expression of hard and energetic will he had a large straight nose wide mouth thick bushy black hair and a beard of several days growth while in his cap he wore a sprig of freshly plucked edelweiss i invited him into my room but he shrugged his shoulders you wish to go to lancelburg over the sanus he said yes very well give me ten lire the price was very moderate but the fellow struck me as a swaggerer instinctively i did not like him where is your license are you a regular guide i asked i have no license but i have a certificate of honourable discharge i was in the fourth regiment of artillery and your name do you want to know all this for ten lire and he began to laugh sarcastically very well i will tell you my name gratis i am called giovanni odrini has the cross-examination concluded seeing that his smile displeased me he immediately changed his expression and added emphatically ask the landlord about me he will tell you buona sera and he turned and left me abruptly at four o'clock next morning we set out he tied my valise on his back took his alpenstock and set off nimbly whistling a popular chansonnette his gait was peculiar his step made no sound he seemed to glide along having crossed the rushing torrent by the ancient wooden bridge we came to the foot of the mountain leaving the rough road that leads from susa over the lower heights to modane we took a steep by-path that ran in serpentine wanderings over rocks and through woods of fir and pine in climbing we passed a beautiful lavender garden the side of the mountain was quite blue with the flowers and the fresh air of dawn was scented by their fragrance there were also barberries and gooseberries and flowers which were among the first we know in our own land such as dog roses white campions and harebells then for some distance we skirted a wood and as we went higher the larches gave place to pines and yet higher still only stunted herbage grew from the crevices of the bare brown rocks he climbed like a squirrel hardly had he started when he began to talk to me but either from sleepiness or from the feeling of uneasiness which his company gave me i did not answer him at first in the steepest places giovanni turned and offered me his hand but being fresh i refused his aid proud to encounter the rough mountain when we help ourselves with hands and knees and every step must be studied the mind does not notice the fatigue presently however the fellow began to walk by himself abandoning me to my fate 
There was no real danger, but I felt somewhat indignant at seeing him so high on the rocks. Gradually he was increasing the distance between us, and I cried to him to stop, but my voice did not reach him. If it had not been for my valise, I would have returned immediately. I saw he had a piece of paper in his hand and a pencil. Scribbling a few words, he folded the paper and placed it behind a large stone. My suspicions were increased when I saw him abstract something bright and shining from behind the stone and place it in his pocket. It was a revolver. People do not generally go armed into the Cotian Alps, and I somehow felt convinced that the weapon was to be used for no lawful purpose. Perhaps the letter he had written was a message to his confederates, reporting the fact that he had secured a victim. How I regretted that I had not placed my revolver in my pocket instead of putting it in the valise he was carrying. He was standing with his hands in his pockets, whistling a gay air and awaiting me. I was toiling up the steep path and felt almost dead beat. The whole mountain was a mass of gigantic rocks half buried in the sand, soft and moist from recently melted snow and the draining of the ice. I was looking for a franc piece I dropped. It rolled behind that stone and I cannot find it, he said. Then he looked into my eyes and asked with an insolent air, Don't you believe me? No. I did not believe him and began to be greatly disquieted. He perceived it, and immediately became jovial and talkative. He knew me, he said. He had asked the innkeeper about me. He knew that I was a journalist. It must be a fine trade for making money by the sackful. He knew city life, for he had lived in Turin, and he always read the Secolo. It was his favorite paper. He also knew that I had written novels, another gold mine. Writers of romance, he supposed, were always seeking adventure, and poking their noses in out-of-the-way corners, and inquiring into other people's business. Good! I was with him, and might meet with a strange experience presently. But I paid no attention to him. You gentlemen come to the Alps for the fun of knowing what fatigue is, he said. Ah, if you only knew what it was, how much a piece of bread costs! He was eloquent and excitable, and spoke like a man believing himself to be followed by constant persecution. We had almost reached the summit, when suddenly we came upon a rough pillar built of pieces of rock piled together. See, he said, there is the frontier mark. Then we continued walking a dozen paces or so, and were in France. Soon afterwards we recommenced our ascent to the summit trudging through patches of melted snow. For about half an hour we continued our rough climb when he halted, and scanning the mountain cautiously said, Come, follow me quickly. Where, I asked, this surely is not the road to Lancelburg. Do not argue, but come with me, he said impatiently. If you do not, it will be the worse for you, he muttered between his teeth. Linking his arm in mine, he half dragged me along to what appeared to be the face of a perpendicular rock. We passed along a narrow passage behind a great boulder, and as we did so, my strange guide gave a shrill whistle. In a moment a cunningly concealed door in the face of the rock opened, and a wild-haired, black-bearded, brigandish-looking man emerged. I was alarmed, for I saw I had been entrapped. My guide uttered a few words in the Piedmontese patois, which I did not understand, whereupon the man who had opened the door exclaimed, "'The Signor Inglese will please enter.' I hesitated, but I saw that to refuse was useless, so together we went into a large, dark cavern. The bolt of the door was shot back into its socket with an ominous sound, while our footsteps echoed weirdly through the distant recesses. The man took up a torch and guided us through intricate turnings, until at last we came to a door which he opened, and we found ourselves in a small natural chamber, with wonderful stalactites hanging from the roof. Two sinister-looking men, who were seated at a rough deal-table drinking and playing dominoes, rose as we entered. Neither spoke, 
but the man who had admitted us poured out some cognac and handed it to me, afterwards filling the other glasses. The men lifted them to me and tossed off the contents, an example which I followed. "'We are safe here,' observed Giovanni, turning to me, "'safe from the storm, the frontier guards, from everything.' "'I engaged you to conduct me to Lancelburg, not to bring me here,' I said severely. He smiled. "'This cave has been the grave of many men,' he replied, as he calmly selected a cigar from the box upon the table. "'It may be yours.' "'What do you mean?' I cried, thoroughly alarmed. "'Surely you understand,' exclaimed the man who admitted us. "'We are outlaws, brigands, contrabandists. "'Whatever you like to call us in your language, it is quite immaterial. "'Come with me and I will convince you.' Again I hesitated. "'Follow,' he commanded, taking up the torch. Together we descended a short flight of roughly hewn steps into a small, dark, damp-smelling cavern below. As he lifted the torch above his head I saw that the place was occupied. I shuddered and drew back in horror. Upon a heap of dirty, moldy straw lay a woman— her dress was ragged and faded, but she was very beautiful, with light golden hair and a face that betokened culture and refinement. Around her neck was a curious band of blood-red color. Upon her countenance was a ghastly pallor. The lips were bloodless, the jaw had dropped, the eyes were fixed and had a stony, horror-stricken look in them, for she was a corpse. "'You are satisfied that we are brigands?' he asked. "'Good. Now I will show you that we are contrabandists.' Ascending the steps, we went to another part of the great cave, where he showed me kegs of cognac and wine, boxes of cigars, silks, and an assortment of dutiable merchandise. When we returned to where the other men were sitting, one of them, the elder of the party, who spoke with authority, addressed me. "'Well,' he said, "'you have seen our stronghold "'and recognize the impossibility of any one escaping from here, eh?' "'Yes,' I replied, "'but I cannot conceive why I have been allured here. "'I am a poor man and not worth robbing.' "'That is not our intention, Signore,' the contrabandist answered with mock politeness, "'as he puffed a cloud of smoke from his rank cigar.' "'True, you have been entrapped, but if you consent to perform for us a small secret service, you are at liberty to depart, and, moreover, our good Giovanni will complete his contract and see you safely to Lancelburg. "'What is the service?' I asked. "'It is not at all difficult, and you will run no risk,' he replied. He took from an ancient oak coffer a small sealed packet and added, we desire this taken to Briançon. Will you undertake to do so? What am I to do with it? I asked. The thing is simple enough. He will leave here and go to Lancelburg, thence to Briançon. Arrived there, you will remain at the Corone d'Or and wear this piece of Edelweiss in your coat. On the day after tomorrow, a lady will call upon you and ask for the packet as promised. She will give her name as Madame Trois Etoiles, and will give you a receipt for the packet. This you will send to Giovanni Aldrini at the post restaurant at Bardoneccia. There the matter will end. If she does not call, then you must advertise to find her, announcing that you particularly desire an interview. Of course your undertaking will be binding— and you will preserve the secret of the existence of this place under penalty of death. Do you agree? I glanced round the weird cavern. The last straw of my self-possession was broken, and I was prepared to promise anything in order to escape. Agree, Signore, urged Giovanni anxiously. There will be no risk, no inconvenience, I assure you. "'Very well,' I said at last. "'If you stipulate this as the price of my ransom, "'I suppose I am compelled to submit.' "'You will swear to preserve our secret, "'to tell no living soul where you obtained the packet, "'and to deliver it without fail and with the seals intact?' "'the elder man asked, 
handing me a carved ivory crucifix. "'Yes, I swear,' I said, taking it and pressing it to my lips. "'Good!' he exclaimed. "'Here is the packet. "'Deliver it safely, for its contents, if lost, could never be replaced. "'Join us in another glass, and then proceed. "'Oldrini will go with you to the outskirts of Lancelburg. "'I emptied another glass of brandy with the smugglers, "'and a few minutes later saw the sunlight and breathed the fresh mountain air again.' When we were well on our downward path, I felt inclined to reprimand my guide for having taken me to the cavern, but on reflection it became plain that he was in league with the contrabandists, and that he carried on smuggling and thieving in the guise of guide. Onward we trudged down the steep, slippery rocks, scarcely uttering a word for an hour, when suddenly from a sentry-box there appeared a French soldier with rifle presented. He inquired our names and why we wished to enter France. A civil reply propitiated him, and he drew himself up at attention and allowed us to proceed. We were compelled by the steepness of the mountain to take a circuitous route, so that the descent occupied longer than we had anticipated, and when, soon after sunset, we emerged upon the high road to Lancelburg, he halted to take leave of me. "'Pardon, Signore,' exclaimed my guide. "'I only took you to the cavern because it is imperative that the package should be delivered. "'I ask your forgiveness.' "'And he raised his cap deferentially. "'For what reason is it imperative?' I inquired. "'I regret I cannot tell you,' he replied. "'Adio, Signore. Remember your trust, and keep your promise, or—' "'He did not finish the sentence, but shrugged his shoulders significantly.' and handing me my valise, turned and left me. End of chapter 13, part 1Stolen Souls by William Le Cue. Chapter 13. The Blood Red Band. Part 2. Two days later I was sitting idly smoking at a little table outside the Couronne d'Or Inn at Briançon, that curious little town inside the great fortress that commands the pass of Mont Genevre. The Alps were purple in the glorious sunset. The sun had long ago been hidden by the mountains behind, on whose tops ice and snow glistened. Then, as the calm twilight came on, a pale rosy light suffused the eastern sky. The moon rose, the aspens shook, the outlines of the valley shaded off into darkness and uncertainty, and the last glow sank into the deepening blue. Having telegraphed to my friends, arranging to meet them at Grenoble on the morrow, I sat silent, thoughtful, and expectant. Suddenly a musical voice behind exclaimed in English, "'The Signore wears the Edelweiss, I observe.' "'Yes,' I replied, turning and confronting a tall, handsome, middle-aged lady, attired in deep black. She was evidently of the upper class, and spoke English with an accent scarcely perceptible. A fact which struck me as very remarkable was that around her neck she wore a band of blood-red silk, exactly the same as that upon the corpse in the brigand's cave. What could it denote? I presume I am not mistaken in addressing you. I am Madame Trois Etoiles. I have been expecting you, I said. "'You have been commissioned to deliver something to me, have you not?' she asked, seating herself in the chair on the opposite side of the table. "'Yes. I must confess, however, that my mission is a somewhat mysterious one.' And I drew the packet from my pocket. "'Mine is also mysterious,' she laughed nervously. "'But tell me, who gave it to you?' "'Unfortunately, I must not tell, madame. I am sworn to secrecy,' I replied. Then I asked— why is it imperative that the packet should be conveyed to you in this manner? Ah, Signore, I am as ignorant as yourself. Besides, I also have taken an oath. 
It was a stipulation that I should explain nothing. I was to meet you here and receive the packet, to act as messenger, in fact. That is all. "'Then we cannot exchange confidences,' I said disappointedly. She shook her head. "'Very well. There is the mysterious packet,' and I handed it to her. Then I tore a leaf from my pocket-book, and, together with a pencil, handed it to my strange visitor, who wrote in Italian the words, "'Received of Signore the Englishman, the packet with seals intact. Madame, three stars.' Passing the paper back to me, she drew on the glove she had removed, and, rising, wished me a haughty adieu, remarking that she was obliged to leave for Modane by the diligence which would start almost immediately from the Hôtel de Ville. I raised my hat, and, after a graceful bow, she turned, and, walking away along the quiet old world street, was soon lost in the gathering gloom. One evening, quite recently, I was sitting in the Trattoria di Piazza San Carlo, that great gilded restaurant that overlooks the handsome square in the centre of Turin. Major Malaspina, of the National Guard, was with me, and we were chatting over our coffee and cigars. Giulio Malaspina is an old friend whom I first met ten years ago, when, in the performance of my journalistic duties, I visited the cholera hospitals of Naples with King Humbert and Queen Margarita. Mainly through him, various facilities were afforded me for visiting the hospitals and passing the military cordon as often as I pleased. Hence our acquaintance ripened into warm and lasting friendship. Short and thick-set, with closely cropped iron-gray hair and a fierce bristly moustache, he is a merry little man, and at the present time the most popular officer of the Turin garrison. He was glancing through the tribuna which the waiter had just brought, while I sat lazily contemplating the groups of diners through a veil of tobacco smoke. "'Ah!' he exclaimed suddenly, removing the cigar from his lips and looking up from the paper. "'I see they've captured a band of robbers in the Carpathians.' It is really remarkable that brigands should exist in Europe in these highly civilized days. Are there any in the Alps, I asked, half inclined to relate my extraordinary experience, but suddenly remembering that I had bound myself to secrecy. There were, but there are none now. I assisted in clearing out the last band. They were clever, daring scoundrels, who exhibited much remarkable ingenuity. The discovery of the gang caused a good deal of sensation about two years ago, but of course you were in England at that time. Possibly you heard nothing about it? No, tell me, I said anxiously. I'm always interested in stories of brigands. Plots for novels, eh? he said, laughing merrily, contemplating the fine diamond that glittered on his finger. Well, he began, for a long time it had been known that a number of contrabandists were smuggling goods from France over the almost impassable summit of Mont Cenis. They were Piedmontese brigands, then, I exclaimed in surprise. Yes, travellers had been robbed, diligences on the Modane Road had been stopped, baggage rifled, and various depredations were being constantly reported. It was evident that they were in league with some receivers of stolen property at Milan, but the ingenious manner in which they disposed of their booty baffled all efforts to discover the identity of the thieves. Probably they would have continued their nefarious operations unmolested until the present time, had they not committed a most daring robbery which very nearly culminated in a public scandal. Per Bacco, there is more comedy than tragedy in this story. You must be discreet if I relate it to you, for it is not generally known, and if it got about, a good deal of displeasure might be created at the ministry at Rome. And amused at his own thoughts, he laughed heartily. It happened about three years ago, he continued, that the king, while inspecting the crown jewels, discovered that the small jewelled cross which surmounts the great historic diamond of enormous value that forms the apex of the royal crown was loose, and, moreover, the great gem itself required resetting. 
After much consideration, it was at length resolved to entrust the work to a renowned jeweller in Paris, and the portion of the insignia was dispatched thither by royal messenger. The latter, it appears, took train by way of Turin and the Montsenis tunnel, but on arrival at the Alpine frontier found that some repairs were being carried out in the tunnel, which necessitated it being closed to all traffic for several days. He was unable to walk through because there had been a landslip. That the crown should be renovated without delay was imperative, as it was required for an important state ceremonial. Therefore the messenger resolved to go by mule over the mountain to Modane. On the way, however, he and his guide were attacked, and the contrabandists carried away, among other things, the precious packet containing the most valuable portion of the regal crown. The major's eyes twinkled merrily, and he laughed immoderately. Suddenly, noticing my grave, anxious expression, he said, "'Ah, of course you are interested. Dio mio, it was a huge joke. You desire to hear the denouement?' "'Well, you may easily imagine His Majesty's wrath when the matter was reported to him, "'but the gravity of the situation lay in the fact that any hue and cry raised "'would create a public scandal, and in all probability cause the thieves to destroy the jewels. "'Had the newspapers got wind of the theft, "'the whole of Europe would be laughing at Italy's ludicrous discomfiture.' For several weeks the frontier guards kept a sharp lookout on the mountain, but no traces of the thieves could be discovered. Therefore at Rome a good deal of anxiety began to be felt. At length, however, the king himself received a letter from the scoundrels, stating that they had discovered the nature of their booty, and as loyal subjects of his majesty, and upholders of the dignity of the kingdom, they desired to return the portion of the crown. They stipulated, however, that the packet containing the jewels would only be given up to the Countess di Palermo, one of the Queen's ladies-in-waiting, and that if she called on a certain evening at an inn at Briançon, the packet would be duly delivered to her. Cool, audacious impudence, wasn't it? Yes, I said, but how ineffably loyal they were. Most extraordinary rascals! Of course the king gave a pledge that no attempt would be made to trace whence the jewels came, and that the countess alone would keep the appointment. She did so, and, remarkable to relate, the packet was handed to her by some wayfaring Englishman whose name never transpired. In that manner the most valuable of the crown jewels was recovered, greatly to the satisfaction of His Majesty, the Council of Ministers, and all who were in the secret. Malaspina puffed vigorously at his cigar for a few seconds, and then continued, "'The recklessness of the outlaws was amazing. Robbery and extortion became more frequent, and thefts were committed with as cool determination as if the scoundrels held special license from the king. At length the minister of police decided that such a state of things should no longer be allowed to continue.' Hence it was that I found myself at the head of a company of Bersaglieri scouring the mountains from Mont Blanc to Mont Rosa. After much fruitless search we discovered that the stronghold of the bandits was a remarkable cave almost on the summit of the Cenis, at a point accessible only by a secret by-path. Having carefully laid our plans, we advanced to the attack early one morning, Unfortunately the mountain afforded no cover, therefore our presence must have been immediately detected. Eventually, however, we battered down the door of their hiding-place and entered. To our surprise we found the cavern was an enormous one, and it took us a considerable time to explore its recesses. In the meantime the occupants, whoever they were, must have escaped by another exit, for we never saw them, and they have not been apprehended to this day. In the cavern I found quantities of contraband goods stored, and every evidence of extensive smuggling. One discovery I made was indeed horrible, yet on closer investigation it proved as grimly humorous as the other incidents. 
into a lower chamber i had descended with a light and found to my amazement the body of a beautiful woman who had evidently been kept a prisoner and had died under harsh treatment apparently she had expired quite recently for there were no signs of decomposition at first i felt inclined to retreat but the expression in the wide-open, staring eyes attracted my attention, and I bent and touched the face. It was clammy and cold, but quite hard. A portion of it came off in my hand. Dio, I had been deceived. It was of wax. Wax, I cried, astonished. Yes, inquiries I subsequently made showed that a travelling waxwork show on its way across the frontier had been attacked a couple of years before, and among other things stolen was this wax figure. With cunning ingenuity the contrabandists had contrived to transform the ruddy visage of a wax desdemona into the pallid countenance of a corpse, which they placed upon a heap of filthy straw in the damp, dark lower chamber. Around its neck, for some reason unaccountable, they had placed a scarlet band, similar to that always worn by the Countess de Palermo to conceal a cicatrice. The object, I suppose, was to show the corpse to travellers whom they entrapped in order to extort money from them by threatening to keep them in the Dantean dungeon and starving them to death. A most ingenious device, I said in abject astonishment. The cave is now deserted, I suppose? The cave? Poof! and he raised both his hands with a movement indicative of an explosion. Acting under orders from Rome, a party of engineers blew it up with dynamite. As regards the thieves, no one knows what became of them. It must be admitted, however, that they had one redeeming characteristic, that of loyalty to their exemplary sovereign. And Major Malaspina laughed, sipped his vermouth, and lapsed into the full enjoyment of his long cigar. End of chapter 13, part 2STOLEN SOULS by William Le Cue. CHAPTER Fourteen. A CHILD OF THE SUN Sadness and joy, despair and ecstasy, were never so linked as they are in my soul to-night. Many men have gone mad upon far less provocation, and yet I am calm, so calm with this whirligig of emotions that I surprise myself. Ah, it will not be long, ere it is all over. Death will bring oblivion, the game will stop, and though joy, ecstasy, and delight all flee, sadness, misery, and despair will be banished with them. Remorse will cease to gnaw, that everlasting longing for what can never be will end its torture, and I shall be at peace. But if there should not be rest upon the grave, bah, I'm upset, and I imagined I was calm. There is a superlative in suffering, as in everything else, and I have reached it. Death at its worst can have no further horrors. Three drops from this phial in my hand into that glass of cognac at my elbow, and my ticket is made out. One gulp, and I shall have started on my journey. Ah, it was not an unpleasant draught, slightly bitter perhaps. The spirit was strong, a bitter potion, a sweet release. It is merely a question of time. A few minutes now, and I shall be carried from here to the hereafter. How strangely my memory stirs. Am I dreaming, or am I really growing young again? It is the evening of a hot August day. The sun has disappeared in a blaze of crimson and gold. The breeze rises, and the broad plage at Scheveningen is swept by the refreshing wind scudding across the North Sea. Long, sharp-crested snowy waves are breaking into hissing spray on the shore, and, chased in by the heavy weather, the picturesque Dutch fishing smacks fly like gulls to reach the anchorage behind the lighthouse towards Luzdynen. 
The casino is ablaze with light, on top of the light dune dominating the villas and hotels that line the beach. There is dancing this evening, for the season is at its height, as Le Petit Courier says. Men of the Autant are promenading on the broad terrace, and gazing on the file of fair ladies who are arriving, one after the other, in ball dress. They are mainly Belgians in queer hats, and Parisians in limp cravats, but there are some Dutch and English among them, and these are none the less merry. Close to me, half a dozen loungers are smoking cigars and talking loud enough for me to overhear. A handsome elderly fop sets the key, and the others laugh in chorus whenever he utters a bon mot. I'm open to bet that the lovely Valerie de Noirville will not come, he says. Her foster father has left her to mope alone at the Deutschmann. He is already sitting at the Ecarte table, where he stands alone against all comers. I'm afraid, my dear Victor, you'll not see your incomparable Valerie this evening. I confess that, after all, I don't care very much, replies the person addressed, shrugging his shoulders. This Southron is too dark-skinned, and has got a hasty temper, too. For me, I only like the blondes. That may be, but her millions will please you, I fancy. It is an open secret that Mademoiselle is the favourite in the will, and she certainly is the most fascinating girl. De Noirville hasn't the least desire to have his will executed just yet. Besides, why should I waste time over her? The place is taken already. At Paris, yes, by René Delbay. Everybody knows that. But at Scheveningen? The same here, the same here, old fellow. The lady with the black eyes never pines alone, not even at seaside resorts. What is amusing is that our excellent friend, de Noirville, does not notice how desperately his daughter flirts. Yet he's seen a great deal of life, and if I had been married twice, I think I should know how to play the watchdog. Eh? Has she a cavalier here? Who? Who? A poor devil of a lieutenant in the Chasseurs d'Afrique. He adores her and believes he has no rival. Nobody knows him. He is a mere chance-met gallant. Infernal impertinence to aspire to the hand of la belle Valérie, remarks one. Is it a serious affair? inquires another. Was Valérie ever serious? asks the elder man with a laugh. No, my dear fellows, she's only serious with René Delbay, but then he's one of the richest men on the bourse. I turn away to hide myself, for they are speaking of me. I, Lucien Perafit, am the poor devil of a lieutenant, and it is true that I adore Valerie, the charming girl of whom these jays had spoken with so much recklessness. Although I had known her for several months, first in Paris and afterwards here on the Dutch coast, I had not breathed one word of love. Why should I not do so to-night? She was alone at the hotel. There could be no more fitting opportunity. Retracing my steps along the plage to the Hotel Deutschmann, I found her sitting upon the veranda alone, plunged in a deep reverie. In one of those huge wicker chairs which one sees nowhere else but at Schwenningen, I took a seat beside her, and, grasping her white hand, raised it to my lips. How long I sat there I cannot tell. It must have been several hours. Before we rose to enter the hotel, she had admitted that she loved me, and as a pledge of her affection had given me a turquoise ring from her finger, while I had kissed her passionately, she returning my caresses and appearing supremely happy. Yet it was in a brief fool's paradise that I existed that night, for before midday on the morrow I had left Scheveningen, having received a telegram from one of my comrades in Paris, urging me to return at once, as the regiment was ordered to Africa immediately. Such was the irony of fate. Just as I had won the love of the woman I worshipped, I was torn away from her without scarcely an opportunity of bidding her farewell. We may all three die tonight, the words were spoken by Captain Lavignac who, with myself and Lieutenant Morel, were crouching around the dying embers of our campfire. "'That's true,' remarked Morel, "'but if so, we shall die for France, and, after all, is life worth living?' We laughed, blasé boulevardiers that we were. Having been nauseated by the sweets of life, we were now face to face with death. 
the expedition against the fanatical Kel Ahamelen was much more perilous than we had anticipated. General Le Pelletier, who commanded the Algerian forces, had sent us, a mere handful of men, from Insalar away into the wild, inhospitable, tanners roofed desert, in pursuit of a horde of dusky rebels. But the long, weary ride across the burning plains to Jedeid had taken all the spirit out of us. Under a blazing sun we had been journeying for a week, and on this particular night were encamped in a small oasis of Am Ohanan, which consisted of a well of brackish water and one single palm. Unfortunately, owing to the treachery of our native guide, who, by the way, was summarily dealt with by being shot, we had entered a trap laid for us by the enemy. Our scouts had only an hour before reported that we were surrounded by the Arabs, who greatly outnumbered us, and that our position was extremely grave. We were therefore waiting in the momentary expectation of a night attack. For myself, I did not care. Since my arrival in Africa, I had received several warm, affectionate letters from Valerie, but alas, my awakening had come. By the same mail that had brought her last letter to Algiers, I had received from a friend a Figaro, which contained the following announcement in its high-life column. A marriage has been arranged and will shortly take place between Mademoiselle Valerie de Noirville, who is well known in Paris society, and Monsieur René Delbay. Perfidious fate! I had been tricked by her, and all her declarations of love were false. Heart-sick and jaded, I sat beside the smouldering embers, thinking over the hopelessness of my future. The discovery of Valerie's baseness had crushed me. With the exception of the crackling of the fire and the measured tread of the sentry beyond, all was still in the bright, clear night. Around the well our men were lying, wrapped in their cloaks, but not sleeping. Each man, with his revolver in one hand and the bridle of his horse in the other, was ready at any moment to spring up, mount, and ride straight into the irregular column of brown-faced, white burnous foe, who had sworn on their Koran to exterminate us Christian dogs. The moments passed, breathless and exciting. Kiela suddenly demanded a sentry, causing us to start. Ami pour la France, was the response and in a moment later Colonel Shadoum joined us. "'There will be fighting tonight,' he said briefly. "'There are thousands of those black devils.' "'There will not be so many when our sabres have whirled through them,' observed Lavignac grimly. "'We are caught like rats in a trap,' whispered the Colonel in a low tone, so that the men should not overhear his misgivings. "'The only way in which we can save ourselves is to apprise Le Pelletier of our position.' and give him a plan of the country between Inzize and Chicxala from the survey we have made. But how can we? asked Morel. Whoever went would have to pass the lines of the enemy at the risk of being shot. We were silent for several minutes. I will go, I said at last. You? exclaimed the three men in surprise. I nodded. I will make the attempt, I added. But you must carry the plan as well as the letter, and start before daybreak, said the colonel. I am ready, I replied. I set but little value upon my life, for, truth to tell, I was utterly reckless now Valerie was false to me. In the grey hour before the dawn, I left the camp. I had exchanged my scarlet trousers and gilt-braided tunic for a shapeless white burnous, and about my head wore a hake, around which was twisted many yards of brown camel's hair. My face had been effectually dyed a deep brown. I had assumed a flowing black beard, and my bare feet were thrust into rough slippers. Anyone who had met the inoffensive Arab trader from El Biod would scarcely have suspected him to be an officer of the Chasseur d'Afrique, and a well-known figure in drawing-rooms on the Avenue de Champs-Élysées. Mounted on a camel, with well-filled bags across my saddle, I rode slowly along, over the rough stony desert, eastward, guided only by the streak of yellow light that heralded the dawn. Far away upon the horizon was a low range of hills, at the foot of which the Kel Ahamalem were encamped. I knew it was useless to evade passing through their lines by taking a circuitous route, and had decided that it would be safer to act boldly, and endeavour to pass through their headquarters. For hours I rode wearily onward, 
the pitiless rays of the blazing sun beat down upon the loose parched earth and their reflection almost blinded me not a breath of wind cooled the atmosphere but on the contrary the blasts which ever and anon blew over the great sahara whirling up dense clouds of sand were like whiffs of hot air from a furnace the sun travelled its course and sank behind me with a blood-red angry glare that bathed the desert and mountains with brilliant tints by shading my eyes with my hands i could now distinguish that i was approaching the settlement of the hostile tribe and could make out their scattered tents as i looked i saw four figures approaching they grew nearer rapidly then i saw they were mounted arabs galloping with all speed towards me they were standing in the stirrups in the manner peculiar to the bedouins of the great desert and with their long rifles carried high above their heads and their white bernouses flowing behind were bearing down upon me drawing a long breath i collected all the courage i possessed a few minutes later with wild yells the brown-visaged quartet rode up to me addressing rapidly uttered questions in arabic which i answered coolly i told them that i had no sympathy with war that i was a trader from el biod and that my destination was in salah where i constantly had commercial transactions but how camest thou here asked the great black-bearded fellow who had first addressed me as he fixed his keen eyes upon mine i rode i replied in arabic a language in which i was fortunately proficient allah hath protected me didst thou not see the red-legged french dogs yes i passed them yesterday there are thousands of them this statement seemed to cause them considerable dismay they held a hurried conversation in an undertone and then informed me that i should have to go before the sheikh an hour later i was taken before the chief of the tribe who was seated cross-legged on a mat outside his tent he was a grey-bearded wizen-faced old man whose eyes had lost none of the dark brilliance of youth and whose teeth shone white in contrast with his red lips and sun-tanned yellow face as i was led up to him and the manner in which i had been discovered explained he slowly removed his long pipe from his mouth and regarded me critically thou sayest the french the accursed offspring of elbis are numerous where didst thou see them in an oasis near tigadhurt ah thine accent thou speakest french then yes father i replied i learned it in algier he grunted dubiously and turning to a great brawny giant who stood among the followers who crowded around him leaning upon their guns uttered a few guttural words did not the sons of offal stop thee he inquired relate unto me all thou knowest about them i know nothing i replied bowing submissively i merely passed having satisfied them that i was not a spy i had no object in interesting myself in the movements of infidels the old sheikh replaced his shabuk between his lips and continued smoking in thoughtful silence having fixed his gaze intently upon me hum he grunted then he proceeded to interrogate me regarding my ride from el biod my replies however did not apparently remove his suspicions and he smiled sarcastically now and then at the same time watching contemplatively the thin columns of blue smoke that rose from his pipe suddenly he turned and addressing the men who had ridden out to meet me gave orders that i should be searched i stood silently by watching the men turn out and examine closely the contents of my saddle-bags and the food i was carrying then they proceeded to search my pockets compelling me to raise my arms above my head pest fate was again unpropitious as i raised my hands my loose burnous fell from my arms leaving them bare and disclosing that they were white ah cried the sheikh his bright eyes flashing with anger so thou art a spy thou son of a dog seekest the overthrow of allah's chosen my father i cried i i am not a spy behold i have neither knife nor gun is it not written that the one worthy of praise showeth mercy only to the merciful seize the dog take him away and let him be shot at dawn as soon as there is sufficient light to distinguish a black thread from a white the old rebel commanded with a wave of his sun-tanned hand then rising he cast aside his pipe impatiently 
and was about to enter his tent when his passage was barred by a veiled girl in rich silks and gauzes who stood for a moment gazing at me her adjar although concealing her face left visible a fine pair of sparkling black eyes and a forehead that had been plentifully bedaubed with powder in the manner of eastern women rows of golden sequins hung upon her brow and upon her wrists and bare ankles were jingling bangles hold she cried in a commanding tone raising her bare arm and addressing the sheik though innocent of any crime thou hast condemned him to die is it not written in the book of everlasting will that mercy should be shown unto the weak he is a rumi and his tribe will be consumed with the unquenchable fire in al hawayat answered the chief of the rebels of a verity thou speakest the truth she said but is it not also written that thou shalt not transgress by attacking the infidel first for allah loveth not the transgressors i have spoken roared the sheik in anger seek not to argue but return unto thy divan the son of a dog shall die and pushing her roughly aside he strode into his tent amid the murmured approbation of the crowd of dark-visaged horsemen who had assembled brothers she cried in a voice that betrayed her agitation the rumi now before thee hath fallen into our hands therefore we should show him mercy i halima fatma daughter of thy sheikh upon whom may the one merciful pour abundant blessing appeal unto thee on his behalf wilt thou not release him and lift from my heart the weight which oppresseth it in the silence that followed she gazed appealingly around no they answered when they had whispered among themselves our sheikh hath condemned the spy he seeketh to betray us and must die i am hungry i cried as after further vain argument the sheikh's daughter was turning away it is permissible i suppose to have a last meal saying this i stopped and picking up the small loaf which the arabs had taken from my saddle-bag commenced to eat it with a coolness which apparently astonished the group of freebooters of the plains through that balmy moonlit night i remained where my captors had left me bound to a palm tree in the vicinity of the settlement hour after hour i waited alone watching the beauty of the oriental sky and longing for the end i knew i should receive no quarter that ere the sun rose i should be shot down and my body left to the vultures my thoughts reverted to my boyhood to my gay reckless career in paris and most of all to valerie the moon was fast disappearing and i was calmly watching for the steely gray light which in the desert is precursory of dawn when suddenly i heard a footstep the person was concealed behind some huge boulders and i concluded that it was one of my captors who had mounted guard over me yet as i listened the step sounded too stealthy like those of a light-footed thief i stood breathless in wonderment when suddenly a slim white-robed figure crept from behind the rocks and advanced towards me it was an arab youth he placed his fingers upon his lips indicative of silence as he came up to me i gazed at him in surprise for his hate concealed his face hush he whispered in arabic make no noise or we may be discovered it is cruel that a brave officer like thyself should be murdered he added i have come to save thee how didst thou know i was an officer ask no questions he replied and drawing a keen knife from beneath his burnous he severed the cords that bound me thou art free he said come follow me picking up the bread i had not eaten i thrust it into my pocket and followed my unknown friend up a stony path that led into a narrow mountain pass when some distance from the settlement we came to a clump of trees to one of which was tethered my camel quick mount and ride away he urged keep straight through the pass and when thou gainest the desert turn at once towards the north a day's journey from here will bring thee unto the encampment of thy comrades only a day's journey i cried to what do i owe the sudden interest that the daughter of the sheikh hath taken in my welfare i asked laughing i know not women have such strange caprices sometimes but get away quickly he urged lose not a moment or thou wilt be overtaken slama allah islamic 
Turning from me, he hurried away, not, however, before I had discerned, in the faint grey light, that the face half hidden by the spotless hake surrounding it was beardless, evidently that of a woman. Was it Halima herself? At first I was prompted to follow and ascertain, but next second I saw the grave risks we both were running, and, mounting my swift Meheri, started off at a gallop over the rough stones and dunes of loose, treacherous sand. Suddenly the crack of a rifle startled me. Then, as I glanced back, I saw, to my amazement and dismay, the slim Bernouse figure lying in a heap upon the stones, while three yelling, gesticulating Arabs were standing over it, cursing, brandishing their knives, and shaking their fists. Evidently they had shot my rescuer. To linger, however, would mean death. Therefore, on emerging from the path, I took the route described by the mysterious person who had given me my freedom, galloping over the trackless desert in a northerly direction, with eyes eager to discern the encampment of Safis and Zouaves. Before nightfall I was safe within the French lines, relating to General Le Pelletier the events of my journey, and explaining the perilous position of the 39th Regiment. "'But you mentioned something of dispatches and a plan of the country,' he said. "'Yes, I have them here.' I replied. Then, taking from my pocket the half-eaten roll of bread, I broke it, and took therefrom two small pieces of paper. One was a map, in miniature, showing the route he was to travel, and the other the dispatch. "'We are close upon them now,' I remarked to an officer riding by my side on the next night. "'They'll fight like demons.' Hardly had the words passed my lips before wild yells of rage rent the air on every side, and ere we could realize it, we had surprised the encampment of the Kel Ahamalan, and rifles flashed on every side. I need not describe the desperate hand-to-hand -hand conflict in the darkness. Suffice it to say that we punished the tribe for their temerity in sentencing me to death. When, in the early morning, after a severe engagement, we walked among the ruins of the tents, and heaps of dead, I searched diligently for Halima, being aided by a dozen other officers and men, but we did not discover her, and I became convinced that my worst fears were realized, and that she had fallen a victim to the relentless vengeance of her people. Nearly two years elapsed before I again trod the asphalt of my beloved Paris. A few weeks after my return to civilization, I attended a ball at the German embassy. I had been dancing and was taking my partner, a rather skittish widow, into the supper room, when I accidentally stepped upon and rent the dress train of a dark-haired girl who, leaning upon the arm of an elderly man, was walking before me. She turned, and I bowed my apologies. The words died from my lips. The woman, whose flower-trimmed dress I had torn, was Valerie. It was a mutual recognition, but neither of us spoke. Half an hour later, however, I was sitting alone with her. To my fierce demands for an explanation of the sudden breaking off of her communications, she replied boldly and with such an air of veracity that I hated myself for having spoken so harshly. Judge my joy when she told me she was still unmarried, that the paragraph in the Figaro was unauthorized, and that it had been inserted by some unknown enemy during her absence from Paris. Then you are not Madame Delbe? I cried with ill-concealed delight. Certainly not. Monsieur Delbe is an old friend of our family. That is all, she replied, laughing. After you left Iran, I could not write, as you were away in the desert. I read of your adventures and your bravery in the newspapers, but did not know where a letter would find you. Therefore, I left all explanations of my enforced silence until your return. And you still love me? I asked with trepidation, placing my arm tenderly around her slim waist and drawing her towards me. "'Of course, but, mon cher, you have never doubted me, have you?' "'No,' I replied, after an awkward pause, gazing fondly into her eyes. "'But now I have gained my promotion. Will you become my wife?' Her answer was affirmative, and we sealed our compact with a kiss. "'Would that I could omit this last and terrible chapter of my biography,' But no, the hideous story must be related to its bitter end, to serve as warning to others. Through closed windows and drawn curtains was borne the solemn clang of a bell in a church tower in the Avenue de Villiers, recording the death of today and birth of tomorrow. 
a simple canary in its gilded cage mistaking the morning sunshine the soft glow of electricity as it filtered through its shade of orange silk chirped a matin song in shrill staccato a tiny slippered foot nervously patted the sleek fur of the tiger rug beneath it a strong arm girt a slender waist and between the solemn strokes of the church bell and the cheery passages of the bird song quick passionate kisses alone stirred the scented air the man spoke it was rene delbay i must go now darling he said we have both braved too much already he may return at any moment and if he did valerie asked defiantly he might at least suspect suspect she laughed a chorus to the canary he doesn't know what suspicion means. He would trust me with Mephistopheles himself. Should he find you here, he would only thank you for entertaining me. He is the most easy-going fellow in the world. The man smiled, released his companion from his embrace, and rose from the settee upon which the two had been seated. I'm afraid, my dear, he said, that you presume too much upon his confidence. There is no cord so elastic that it will not snap. I waited for no more, but burst into the room, having, in my frenzy of madness, drawn a revolver from my pocket. Diable, you? cried Delbay, starting up in alarm. Ah, my husband, gasped Valerie, covering her blanched face with her hands. Sacre, you shall die, I shouted. The tolling bell throbbed once more, and then a short, sharp, loud report and a flash together. A little puff of blue-gray smoke floated ceilingward, a man's frightened cry pierced the night, and upon the harmonious colours of the flower-strewn carpet, Valerie lay dead. Rushing to my wife's boudoir, I broke open her escrutoire, bent upon ascertaining the nature of any letters she might have concealed there. There were many. Ah, Dieu, when I think of the passionate love missives penned by the man whom I had implicitly trusted, and admitted to my home as a friend, my brain is lashed to frenzy. One discovery I made was startling. Several of the letters bore the stamp of twenty-five centimes, and their envelopes were addressed to Mademoiselle Halima Fatma, care of Hajj Hassan, Douera Algeri. Searching further, I discovered a full-length cabinet photograph taken in Algiers. It was of Valerie, dressed as the sheikh's daughter, with the exception that the adjar which had hidden the Arab girl's face had been removed. In my surprise, I almost forgot the terrible tragedy. Continuing the investigation of the odds and ends in her private drawer, I found an Arab head ornament and several bracelets. The pattern of the crescent-shaped sequins I recognized as the same as those worn by the mysterious Halima. These discoveries, combined with the contents of the letters which I hastily scanned, left no doubt that Halima and Valerie were the same person, and further that Hassan, the wealthy sheikh of the Ahamalan, who had a house at Touera, was really her father, and that Monsieur de Noirville had brought her up and educated her to the ways of civilized society. When I had left for Algeria, it had been her caprice to follow me and rejoin her people. She had saved my life, yet I had killed her. But though so fair, she was false, false. Bah, how infernally bitter this cognac is. One more gulp, and my body and soul will have parted. I shall rest. Ah, oh, well, here's health to the cursed scoundrel who has wrecked my life. The glass is drained. The sediment was like gall. How it burns. I go. I, I go. I trouble no one longer. Au revoir. Adieu. End of Chapter 14 End of Stolen Souls by William Lecure